a seed eater. I wish he would have stayed home away from this cruel world that we live in. Dear reader, children shouldn't roam this world alone, but we can't keep them in, the, in their nest forever. My son left his room one night to the enchanted chirping outside his window, and I knew what this was, but only from my years of studying this creature. You see, there is a monster that wanders around the globe, preying on innocent children, watching, waiting. I remember fondly, it was September 15th, 1983. That was the year my wife and I escaped the busy world of New York to live our lives in the country, North Dakota. We lived happily there for several years until I discovered my one true love, studying the Seed Eater. The Seed Eater is a disturbed bird-human creature that roams the forest, stalking children, abducting them to be part of the legend. On June 19th, 1987, I first saw it sitting in my tree on my front lawn. I was in a daze when I saw it. My destiny beckoned to me. It said, follow it, love it, learn it. Around the same time, two weeks later, I woke to a strange tapping noise on my front window. I knew it was him. I ran out of the house to see it sitting in the tree, just staring into my eyes. I was about to cry from the majesty of it. I remember it telling me that I wanted, it, wanted my help. I would do anything for it. On April 3rd, 1988, the Seed Eater arrived at my window again. I was overjoyed. It said it was time, and I remember. You see, the Seed Eater devours children to keep itself alive, indulging in their youth to live forever. I remember the little boy. Oh, what was his name? Oh well, it doesn't matter. I remember going to his house and simply knocking on the door at 4.29 a.m., but nobody would answer. I saw the bay window. It was the boy's room. I wanted to tell the sea eater. Let's just call him C.E. for now. He told me how to get his attention the next day. A couple of weeks went by, and the stench of flesh was getting disgusting. Where was S.E.? The parents of the boy put up lost posters last week. I wonder why they didn't worry for the first two weeks. Oh well, I'm not concerned. On May 14th, 1988, the boy was nothing but bloated, rotten, f rotting flesh. And the SE was nowhere to be found. I guess my services weren't needed. May 15th, 1988, he came. He took the boy and requested another. May 16th. 1988. Six kids killed. Six kids devoured. Six more requested. May 18th, 1988. However, losing people makes me wonder. The killer monster seed eater came tonight. He said kids weren't doing the trick anymore. He wanted something bigger. If you're reading this, you may be the only hope of finding out the truth of this thing. In my room, there is a journal. On page 49, you'll discover how to take the life out of this monster. But he, he's had me under a tight death grip. I couldn't do it. But maybe you'll have more strength than me. Goodbye, everybody. I hope being eaten is what I brought on to myself. White with Red A man went to a hotel and walked up to the front desk to check in. The woman at the desk gave him his key and told him that on the way to his room there was a door with no number that was locked and no one was allowed in there. Especially no one should look inside the room under any circumstances. So he followed the instructions of the woman at the front desk, going straight to his room and going to bed. The next night, his curiosity would not leave him alone about the room with no number on the door. 
We walked down the hall to the door and tried the handle. Sure enough, it was locked. He bent down and looked through the wide keyhole. Cold air passed through it, chilling his eye. What he saw was a hotel bedroom, like his, and in the corner was a woman whose skin was completely white. She was leaning her head against the wall, facing away from the door. He stared in confusion for a while. He almost knocked on the door out of curiosity, but decided not to. This, this incarnation saved his life. He crept away from the door and walked back to his room. The next day, he returned to the door and looked through the wide keyhole. This time, all he saw was redness. He couldn't make anything out besides a distinct red color, unmoving. Perhaps the inhabitants of the room knew he was spying the night before and had blocked the keyhole with something red. At this point, he decided to consult the woman at the front desk for more information. She sighed and said, Did you look through the keyhole? The man told her that he had, and she said, Well... I might as well tell you the story. A long time ago, a man murdered his wife in that room, and her ghost haunts it. But these people were not ordinary. They were white all over, except for their eyes, which were red. Mr. Widemouth During my childhood, my family was like a drop of water in a vast river, never remaining in one location for long. We settled in Rhode Island when I was eight, and there we remained until I went to college in Colorado Springs. Most of my memories are rooted in Rhode Island, but there are fragments in the attic of my brain, which belong to various homes we had lived in when I was much younger. Most of these memories are unclear and pointless, chasing after another boy in the backyard of a house in North Carolina trying to build a raft to float on the creek behind the apartment we rented in Pennsylvania, and so on. But there is one set of memories which remains as clear as glass, as though they were just made yesterday. I often wonder whether these memories are simply lucid dreams produced by the long sickness I experienced that spring, but in my heart, I know they are real. We are living in a house just outside the bustling metropolis of New Vineyard, Maine, population 643. It was a large structure, especially for a family of three. There were a number of rooms that I didn't see in the five months we resided there. In some ways, it was a waste of space, but it was the only house on the market at the time, at least within an hour's commute to my father's place of work. The day after my fifth birthday, I came down with a fever. The doctor said I had monoculosis, which meant no rough play and more fever for at least another three weeks. It was a horrible timing to be bedridden. We were in the process of packing our things to move to Pennsylvania, and most of my things were already packed away in boxes, leaving my room barren. My mother brought me ginger ale and books several times a day, and he served the function of being my primary form of entertainment for the next few weeks. Boredom always loomed just around the corner, waiting to heat rear its ugly head and compound my misery. I don't exactly recall how I met Mr. Widemouth. I think it was about a week after I was diagnosed with mono. My first memory of the small creature was asking him if he had a name. He told me to call him Mr. Widemouth because his mouth was large. In fact, everything about him was large in comparison to his body. His, e his head, his eyes, his crooked ears. But his mouth was by far the largest. You, can't, you look kind of like a Furby, I said as he flipped through one of my books. Mr. Widemouth stopped and gave me a puzzled look. Furby? What's a Furby? He asked. I shrugged. You know, the toy. The little robot with big ears. You can pet and feed them almost like a real pet. 
Oh. Mr. Widemouth resumed his activity. You don't need one of those. They aren't the same as having a real friend. I remember Mr. Widemouth disappearing every time my mother stopped to check in on me. I lay under your bed, he later explained. I don't want your parents to see me because I'm afraid they won't let us play anymore. We didn't do much during those first few days. Mr. Widemouth just looked at my books, fascinated by the stories and pictures they contained. The third and fourth morning after I met him, he greeted me with a large smile on his face. I have a new game we can play, he said. We have to wait until you after your mother comes to check in on you. Because she can't see us play, it's a secret game. After my mother delivered more books and soda at the usual time, Mr. Weidman slipped out from under the bed and tugged my hand. We have to go to the room at the end of this hallway, he said. I objected at first, as my parents had forbidden me to leave my bed without their permission, but Mr. Weidman persisted until I gave in. The room in question had no furniture or wallpaper. Its only disgusting feature was a window opposite the doorway. Mr. Wymouth darted across the room and gave the window a firm push, pulling it open. He then beckoned me to look out the ground, out the ground below. We were on the second story of the house, but it was on a hill, and from this angle the drop was farther than two stories due to the incline. I feel like to play pretend up here, Mr. Wymouth explained. I pretend that there is a big soft trampoline below the, this window and I jump. If you pretend hard enough, you bounce back up like a feather. I want you to try. I was five. I was a five-year-old with a fever, so only a hint of skepticism darted through my thoughts. As I looked down, considering the possibility, it's a long drop, I, I said. But that's all part of the fun. It wouldn't be fun, it was only a short drop. If it were that way, you would may as well just bounce on a real trampoline. I toyed with the idea, picturing myself falling through thin air only to bounce back to the window on something unseen by human eyes. But the realist in me prevailed. Maybe some other time, I said. I don't know if I have enough imagination. I could get hurt. Mr. Widemouth's face contorted into a snarl, but only for a moment. Anger gave way to disappointment. If you say so, he said. He spent the rest of the day under my bed, quiet as a mouse. The following morning, Mr. Widemouth arrived holding a small box. I want to teach you how to juggle, he said. Here are some things you can use to practice before I start giving you lessons. I looked in the box. It was full of knives. My parents will kill me. I shouted, horrified that Mr. Widemouth had brought knives into my room. Objects that my parents would never allow me to touch. I'll be spanked and grouted for a year. Mr. Widemouth, Mr. Widemouth frowned. It's fun to juggle with these. I want you to try it. I pushed the box away. I can't. I'll get in trouble. Knives aren't safe to just throw in the air. Mr. Widemouth's frown deepened into a scowl. He took the box of knives and slid under the bed. Remaining there the rest of the day, I began to wonder how often he was under me. I started having trouble sleeping after that. Mr. Widemouth often woke me up at night saying he he put a real trampoline under the window, a big one, one that I couldn't see in the dark. I always declined and tried to go back to sleep. But Mr. Widemouth persisted. Sometimes he stayed by my side until early in the morning, encouraged me to jump. He wasn't so fun to play with anymore. My mother came to me one morning and told me I had her permission to walk around outside. She thought the fresh air would would be good for me, especially after being confined to my room for so long. Ecstatic, I put on my sneakers and trotted out to the back porch, yearning for the feeling of, of sun on my face. Mr. Widemouth was waiting for me. I have something I want you to see, he said. 
I must have given him a weird look because he then said, It's safe, I promise. I followed him to the beginning of a deer trail which ran through the woods behind the house. This is an important path, he explained. I've had a lot of friends about your age. When they were ready, I took them down this path to a special place. You aren't ready yet, but one day, I hope to take you there. I returned to the house, wondering what kind of place lay beyond that trail. Two weeks after I met Mr. Widemouth, the last load of our things had been packed into a moving truck. I would be in the cab of that truck sitting next to my father for a long drive to Pennsylvania. And considered time Mr. Widemouth that I would be leaving. But even at five years old, I was beginning to suspect that perhaps the creature's intentions were not to my benefit, despite what he said otherwise. For this reason, I decided to keep my departure a secret. My father and I were in the truck at 4 a.m. He was hoping to make it to Pennsylvania by lunchtime tomorrow, with the help of an endless supply of coffee and sick and a six-pack of energy drinks. He seemed more like a man who was about to run a marathon rather than one who was about to spend two days sitting still. Early enough for you? He asked. I nodded and placed my head against the window, hoping for some sleep before the sun came up. I felt my father's hand on my shoulder. This is the last move, son. I promise. I know it's hard for you, as sick as you've been. When Staddy gets promoted, we can settle down and you can make friends. I opened my eyes as we backed out the driveway. I saw Mr. Widemouth's silhouette in my bedroom window. He stood motionless until the truck was about to turn onto the main road. He gave a pitiful little wave goodbye. To stake knife in hand. I didn't wave back. Years later, I returned to New Vineyard. The piece of land our house stood upon was empty except for the foundation. As the house burned down a few years after my family left, out of curiosity, I followed the deer trail that Mr. Widemouth had shown me. Part of me expected him to jump out from behind a tree and scare the living bejesus out of me, but I felt that Mr. Widemouth was gone, somehow tied to the house that no longer existed. The trail ended at the new Vineyard Memorial Cemetery. I noticed that many of the tombstones belong to children. Alabaster Angel It's a matchmaking service, asked the doctor, a concerned look on his face. This is the Garden of Eden, replied his host with a smile. The doctor looked around the room with a raised eyebrow and growing discomfort. The elaborate advertisement for the service promising to find your perfect partner had conjured images of a posh office with cushioned chairs, pictures, profiles, and employees in business casual attire. Instead, he found himself in an artist's studio. A stained concrete floor spread around the vegetable to whitewashed wooden walls. A variety of paintings, everything from portraits to landscapes, adorned the walls. Some remained half-finished. His eyes lingered on a particularly colorful impressionist piece. Vibrant green and blue sh sprung from a depiction of a verdant garden or forest encased in ice. Brightly sharp icicles hung from the blooming flowers. The doctor could almost feel a chill in the air when, while looking at it. He forced his attention back to the apparent owner of the studio he found himself in. Dr. Charles Ellis Ellingson, he said, extending his hand toward the woman in front of him. I know, she said with a sly glance riding across a broad, thin-lipped mouth. Nice to meet you in person, Chuck, he frowned in reply. I prefer Charles, he said, trying to keep his voice steady. I'm sure you do, Chaz, she said without a shred of remorse. 
I'm Findalia. I answer to Fed, Dahlia, Maddie, or any other mutation you can think of while you are my client. She turned towards the doorway behind her and waved him onwards. This way, please. As he followed her, Ellingson studied the strange woman. A jet black hair fell down her back and almost to her knees. Although not pretty in a traditional manner, there was a certain allure about the tall, pale-skinned woman. It even seemed to descend the baggy, nondescript clothing she wore, splattered with paint and plaster. He put it into words in his mind, thinking that it was as if someone had used an ancient Roman statue as a mannequin in a thrift store. Entering the next room, the point was driven home further. These are some examples of my work, said Fandalia, reading her hands to encompass the large room filled with at least a dozen statues of men and women. If you see anything you like, let me know, but I can do better for you. The doctor couldn't place the girl's subtle accent. If put to the test, he would have guessed Russian, but there was something just there was just something off about it. I was under the impression that I was here for the purposes of finding a girl, not a statue. He said, growing impatient, his host smirked. Many of them are girls, she said in an enraging matter-of-fact tone. I understand your confusion, though. The ones in here are only examples. Too many flaws for the liking of their commissioners. Let's continue. She headed through the force of statues to a doorway on their left. As Ellingson followed, she glanced at the stone figures. If she had carved them, the girl did indeed have talent. They were ex exquisitely detailed, but he found a lack of emotion on their faces off-putting. The dead expressions and closed eyes reminded him too much of the cadavers back in, metal in med school. Many of them had cracks and chips in them, flawed indeed. A small room of statues did nothing to prepare him for the next room. Welcome to my viewing room. Ellison's jaw dropped as he entered a long, narrow corridor filled to the near capacity with female forms. The statues stood along the sides of a narrow red carpet like a gauntlet stretching far to his right and around a curve. Could you repeat the last few lines you said because Discord's been cutting you off. God damn it. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I'm starting to feel like I'm not hearing the story anymore. All right. Uh, what was the last line you heard? Something about there being chips in the statues. All right. I feel like I heard something about that, but a lot of it was broken off. All right. Here we go. If she had carved them, the girl did indeed have talent. They are exquisitely detailed, but he found a lack of emotion on their faces off-putting. The dead expressions and closed eyes reminded him too much of the cadavers back in med school. Many had cracks and chips in them. Flawed indeed. A small room of statues did nothing to prepare him for the next room. Welcome to my viewing room. Ellingson's jaw dropped as he entered a long, narrow corridor filled to near capacity with female forms. The statue stood along the sides of a narrow red carpet like a gauntlet stretching far to his right and around a curve. The very sizes and shapes and colors defied belief. A goddess-like figure of crystal rose towards the ceiling ahead of him. Across from her, there was a statue of more normal proportions, but formed from pure black onyx. From monstrous to, to benign, the statues took on every shape imaginable. Had this one carved all of these? As he stepped into the hallway and looked around him, Vidalia stood at his side, a look of pride on her face. Impressive, aren't they? She asked. You made all of these? He asked, his voice a whisper. I did. 
she said. But these are for my personal collection. My workshop is this way. The doctor followed her down the hallway, his eyes never leaving the army of statues. He found his gaze straying away from their faces, though. The lifelike look in their eyes, some stone, some gems, sent a chill through him. A particularly demonic figure finally struck enough fear in him to turn his attention to his guide. Why am I going... Why am I in an art gallery, miss? Just Fidelia, she interjected. No, miss. Why am I in an art gallery, Fidelia? He continued. Your advertisement promising... Your advertisement promised finding my perfect partner. Because she doesn't exist, doctor, she said, turning her head and giving him a sidelong wink. But she will, you see. No one's perfect person exists in the real world. People have flaws. People have problems. That girl you see in your mind's eye, in your dreams, will never be a reality. I seem to notice that people fall in love all the time, though, said Ellingson as they reached the bend and the corridor, turning a corner to the right. He noticed that the statues were becoming more normal. None of them towered above them or continued the inhuman traits of the others. People will not admit, to, admit it, of course, said Vidalia. Simple infatuation will make them blind to most flaws, but they'll always see something, always know something they would make different, whether it's wishing they could be a better cook, hoping they would stop liking country music, wanting them to have a bigger, um, anatomy, or wishing they would stop frowning every time they caught their reflection in the window. Everyone has something they would change. I hear quite often from couples that they wouldn't change a thing about their partners, said the doctor. Lies, said Fidelia, her voice as cold as ice. Whether they know it or not, you make people seem shallow, said Ellison, apparently skepticism in his voice. On the contrary, she said, stopping and turning to face him. People may think they know what are superficial things they want, but they have to dig deep to find what they really want, what they really need. She moved closer and put a finger to Ison's chin, drawing his gaze up directly into his, her eyes. He had not noticed before that she was slightly taller than him. Her eyes shone in icy blue as, he, as she studied him. And I can tell exactly what they need, even if they cannot. She released his head and moved towards a line of statues to her side. And what do I need? He asked, catching his breath. An inter interesting case, to be sure, said his host. A doctor filled with fear and doubt, a man perpetually striving to be better. But you doubt he'll ever be good enough, right, Chuck? Now, wait a minute, said Ellison, his voice raising. Adelia interrupted before he could continue. You've been betrayed before. His mouth hung open for a moment and then snapped shut. You don't trust anyone, do you? I wonder what a man like that could use in his life. She ran her hand down the cavern. Hair dropped across the shoulder of a statue to her left. She continued on a past a few more, running a finger over one's arm. Not the harlot, of course, she said, moving away from a figure over-sexualized to the point of ridiculousness. Too many bad memories, I would think. How do you know these things? He asked in his low voice. I try, said Vandalia. Perhaps the doting housewife? She moved towards a patronally figure that was like something out of an old sitcom. No, too unimpressive. You want something you can show off? Ellingson wanted to take offense. 
he wanted to say she was generalizing him. He couldn't. Not the trophy wife either, she said, bypassing a, a felt form that not have looked out of place on a fashion show runway. A bit one-dimensional, wouldn't you say? I would say it's statues. They're all... Thank you! Jesus Christ! OBS. I don't understand why it was doing that. I don't either. Oh! Bookworm is suggesting too much horror for Twitch. And OBS. Maybe, Bookworm. Maybe. Let's see. Oh. Video streaming issues are popping up a lot right now with Twitch. Oh. Jesus fucking Christ. What, 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 what? Hundreds upon hundreds of reports of voice chat issues with Discord. Oh, that makes sense, actually. Well, then. Anyway, let me go back to reading the story. I would say as statues, they are all a bit one-dimensional. He replied. His host ignored him. Intellectual. Adventurer, submissive, she said, walking by the next three. No, no, and no. What does this have to do with what I came here for? Asked Elison. I'm not interested in adding to my art collection. That was not entirely true. Any one of the statues would be the masterwork of most artists. Unlike the earlier statues, the expressions on these were animated and intricate. Some joyous and some heartbreaking. Perhaps, said Vandalia, stopping in front of the imposing statue, a beautiful and proud, its eyes on some fairway invisible horizon. A queen. Ellingson could see the royalty in the figure's bearing. He could barely stand up to look towards the fierce gaze blazing out of the stone eyes. He almost knelt. A bit too strong for you, Chuck, said Videlia. But close, she leaned down slightly and looked into his eyes again, calculating gleam. Rubbing her chin lightly, a smile crept over her face. I think I know. And what do you think I need, Betty? He asked, stressing the nickname. It's simpler than I thought, she said. And more complicated at the same time. You need someone that can take the doubt and fear that drives and throws it out the window. Someone that can pull you back from the brink when you despair. Someone that can make peace with people when you're to you. Someone you would never in a million years add to your stress. You need an angel. Sounds too good be to be true. Said Ellingson. Now you're getting it, said Medelia, her eyes flashing as she shot a finger back towards him. It's, it is too perfect to exist, but I can make it real. Goosebumps ran over Ellison's flesh as he listened to the sculptor in front of him spout madness. Even though he couldn't believe what she was saying, her eyes remained maddeningly lucid. She had seen people go insane before. She didn't have that look in her eyes. She, he decided to humor her a bit longer. It didn't help that she was a. It didn't help that he was afraid to turn his back on her. She mentioned for him to follow again. A moment later, they reached the end of the statue-lined hallway and stood in a huge workshop. The walls appeared to be a solid marble. Vines and flowers climbed along every surface and filled planters along the edges. Dozens of huge blocks of stone surrounded them. 
The perimeter of the room was lined with pristine blocks of every type of stone one could imagine. In the center of the room, frames and ladders surrounded half-revealed, rough-hued statues, dust and debris littered the floor. Now, Chuck, she said. I wonder what type of stone your little angel could possibly be made of. She moved toward the edge of the room and began to study the massive hunks of rocks as carefully as she did the statues themselves. She ran a hand over one with a corpse speckled surface. Ran it? No, far too rough, too difficult. She moved on to a translucent white block. What are you feeling? What are your, what are your feelings on marble? I don't have any feelings about marble. He said, getting tired of the act when she almost certainly knew what she was, she wanted to use. No feelings. Well, we can't do that then. Too predictable, anyways. A tan shredded stone was next. Sandstone, too impermanent. She bypassed the next two without comment. You don't seem like an obsidian man, said Medelia, passing by a shimmering black pillar. What do you mean by that? asked Ellingson. Too many sharp edges, said his guide with a leer. But this, this is something I can work with. She stopped in front of a block of snow-white stone. Seeing it, something about it intrigued the doctor. Perhaps it was the way the light reflected off of it, or the softness in it excluded. But he stepped towards it and it slowly ran a hand down the surface. It didn't, if he didn't know better, he would have thought it felt warm. He thought it felt a dull thud echo from inside it. What is it? said Ellingson. This said Ellingson, his voice awed. Adabaster, said Valdelia with a surprised glee. I like this one, he said. So, Dr. Chuck, said Vidalia, moving between him and the stove. I just need your confirmation, and we can continue the process of finding you your perfect woman. Do you put a woman through the same rigmarole when you call, when they call you looking for a man? Well, if you're into guys, I could take you down the other wing of my gallery. I don't judge. Sure you do, said Ellison. He thought he was just turning around and leaving, his distrust of his host mounting, but he kept looking behind her at the towering ivory block of alabaster. He didn't know what drew him to it, but it was irresistible. He had stopped believing this was anything other than an elaborate con, and for some reason he had to see it out to the end. Clock's ticking, doctor, she said. Fine, uh, fine, he said. I have no idea what the hell is going on here, but go ahead with whatever. How much is this going to cost me? A broad, sadistic grin grew on Vidalia's face. Only a drop of blood, Chuck. What? Without warning, she shot her hand towards him. Fingers splayed for a moment. He was unaware of what had happened, but he felt a sharp pain on his arm. Looking down, he saw that one of her fingernails had cut his arm. Blood was already beginning to flow from the wound. Before he could react, Medelia had put her finger on his arm, collecting a small amount of the blood. What was that for? Roared Ellison, slapping a hand onto his wound. His host merely smiled. Witness the wonders of a dead world, doctor. She said, lightly touching the crimson droplet to the flawless surface of the alabaster. He was about to yell more, but then something strange began to happen. From the spot where her finger had touched, veins of crimson began to sprawl along the stone, radiating outwards as he washed in awe. The lines sunk into the surfaces of the stone. Loud cracks echoed across the room as the veins of blood permeated from the stone, leaving a web of fissures across its entirety. 
Fidelia backed away from the block as the sound began deafening staccato. Then all at once the noise stopped. What's happening? asked Ellingson. The artist remained silent. He was about to ask again when the shattered stone block gave way all at once, collapsing to the floor in an ivory lay inside. For a moment the air was thick with dust and he could see nothing. Then, as the air cleared, his jaw dropped as he saw the vision before him. A perfectly formed statue of a woman stood where a solid block had been just a minute ago before. He could not believe what he was seeing. Even compared to the masterpieces he had already seen, the sculpture was flawless. She stood in stark white glory, hands folded over her heart. A light flowing robe covered her body. Snowy curls surrounded a bowed face that seemed to be asleep with eyes lightly closed and mouth slightly open. She's an angel. Oh wait, what's the wrong voice? She is an angel, said Ellingson, giving him voice to his thoughts without realizing it. Ladies and gentlemen, I think he finally gets it, said Vandalia to an audience of statues. What now? He whispered, still frozen in amazement. Now you wake up. Oh, and I really should have mentioned that you only have four days. Sorry. Everything... Everything around him went black in an instant. Somewhere in the distance, he heard a loud crack in the sound of his own scream. Charles Ellingson awoke to a blaring sound of his alarm clock. His eyes shot open, and he saw that he was in his own room, and it appeared that everything was normal. He slammed a hand on, onto the sleep button of the alarm clock and rolled over painfully in the bed. He took a few minutes to make sure... He was in a real world again. He was never one to have dreams as vivid as the one he had just woken from. But it was supposed the night before must have gotten into his consciousness. Dragging himself out of bed, he felt a dull pain in his arm. He looked at it, almost expecting to see a scar. But he only saw a slight red mark. He must have banged it on something in his sleep. As he got ready that morning, he thought, Back to the day before, he had found an old flyer in the mall. Whoops. As he got ready that morning, he thought back to the day before, he had found an old flyer in the mail, which was somewhere called the Garden of Eden. It had promised their service would find a person's perfect mate, such as the girl in the dream had said. The Dahlia, he muttered, half amused and half regretful. After another day of of work in the plastic surgery center he had been drained. He yes, some of his work was important and life-saving, but the majority of it he found uninspiringly uninspiring. At one time, fresh out of med school, he had passion. His faith in humanity had faded since then, though. After a few drinks that night, he had decided to amuse himself by calling the, the number on the flyer. He thought he would get a laugh out of it at least, although deep down he knew he wondered if it might actually result in him meeting someone. He had gotten neither, though, as the phone on the other end rang once, and then an animated mess voice informed him that the number had been disconnected. There is no winning. After another drink, he had stumbled to bed and passed out. Apparently, the combination of the two things had formed the insane dream. Ellingson was about ready to head out of the door of his spacious two-story home. When the doorbell rang, he sighed, put on his jacket, and went to see who it was. Apparently, he had not moved quickly enough because the doorbell rang three more times in quick succession. He hoped that this was important. Opening the door, he found a delivery man with an annoyed look on his face, standing Side a large crate. Do you want this package or not, buddy? Asked the man. Allison looked at, at his shirt, hoping for a name tag, but finding only the name of the company, MPS. Apparently, customer service is not their strong point. What it? What's in it? 
asked the doctor. My crate was taller than he was. Not my job to know, said the blurry man. Just my job to get it here fast. I did that and more. The thing weighs a ton. Ellingston quickly signed for the package, and the man wheeled the crate into the center of, of his round entry hall, dropping it unceremoniously and heading for the door. You're not going to help me open it? Hell no, said the most unhelpful delivery man in the world before hurling, hurrying out to his truck. Ellingston closed the door as the vehicle sped out of the driveway. He thought about leaving it until that night to open. He was already going to be a few minutes late because of the blurry's horrible timing. While looking at the crate in the middle of the floor, curiosity crept into his mind. His only searching that morning was a facelift. It could wait. Not having a crowbar, he dug through the masses of tools in his closet before finding a large, heavy screwdriver and a hammer. He figured it would work well enough. Watching it beneath the top of the crate, he was amazed how easily the thick plywood came apart. He set the hammer on the floor, finding the screwdriver worked well enough. As soon as he pried the last nail from the top board, the sides of the crate came apart and fell to the floor. His heart skipped a beat as before him in his own house. He saw a statue of a woman carved from pure alabaster. The screwdriver slipped from his hand and he was forced to steady himself on a pillar. His hands shaking, there was absolutely no mistake in the form from his dream that night before. The folded hands, flowing hair, the dress blowing in an imaginary breeze were all the same. He didn't know how long he stood staring before he came to his senses and noticed a small piece of paper among the fallen plywood. He steadied himself, picked it up, and saw one sentence written in, in an elaborate script. What you put into your work, put into her. The note was only signed with, with a large fee. He thought he knew what that stood for. The word work snapped him back into reality for a moment. His eyes flicked to a clock on the wall next to him and he saw that it would, he would be at least... Half an hour late for work, he stared at the Snow White statue for a moment more and pulled himself away from her. He had to get away from this and get his head right. He had to focus on work as he closed the door behind him. He hoped he could. The first opponent of a 40 something socialite was, as expected, infuriated by his tardiness, but he could not care less. Although Steadyfield, Tennessee, where he lived, was not a small city, his plastic surgery center was the only one in it. Any others were hours away, and he was better than any of them anyways. So he believed, at least. He spent the entire pre-surgery process trying to forget about what he was waiting back at his house. He did as, he did as best as he could, and eventually his hands finally calmed. During the surgery, as usual, his focus was like a laser. Just because he didn't believe in what he was doing did not mean he was going to do a poor job. The job paid the bills. The surgery was almost completely uneventful until the very end. As he almost finished putting in the first stitch, his focus on how much smoother his patient's skin was when it reminded him of the unnatural smoothness of the angel in his entrance hall. His hand trembled for a moment just enough to make him uncertain. Nurse, said Ellison, could you finish the stitches for me? She raised an eyebrow towards him. It was a strange thing for him to not do everything himself. I just remembered I have something very urgent to do. The nurse shrugged and took over. It was just as well. The one thing he had never learned how to do well was tie off the stitches. He was horrible with knots. A short while later, he was headed back towards his office when he ran into Kendra Goodson, his assistant. Miss Goodson, he said, stopping her in her tracks. How many appointments do I have this afternoon? Only three, Miss Ellingson, she said with a broad smile. Do you need me to shuffle them around? Just making sure, he said. I may need to leave early today. 
Anything I can help with? She asked eagerly. There was a hint of innuendo in her voice. And I send slide internally. Kendra's a propensity for flirting with male co-workers is an ongoing saga that caused two employees to leave the center. For the last month, she had been the new object of her attention. Trying to persuade her to act professionally had been unsuccessful, and there were failed threats of a wrongful termination lawsuit if she was fired. To be fair, she was a fairly good assistant, so he just dealt with it. Never trust the pretty ones, he thought to himself. No, just some personal issues, he replied. The remaining three appointments were just consultations that went by in a blur. He meant to leave after the last one, but something kept him there. He wanted more time to think about what happened the night before, or he knew it. It was actually past when he normally left and went to the gym. He decided to head to the pub a few blocks from the center. Maybe it would calm his nerves at least. It was almost 10 at night when Ellison returned home and pulled into his driveway. His nerves had not settled as much as he had hoped. As he unlocked the door and pulled it open, an alabaster form greeted him. Walking towards it, he shut his eyes tightly, wondering if it would be gone when he opened them again. It didn't work. He leaned closer to her, stumbling slightly. He had not been that close to the statue before. It was even more remarkable up close. There was no trace of tool marks on the surface. The perception of softness was uncanny. A thought occurred to him that he had no reason for. for. He lowered his head towards it, her heart. He lowered his head towards her torso and turned an ear towards the, the hands over her chest. Carefully, he put his ear to the cold surface of the stone. He held it there for several minutes, wondering what he was doing. Then from somewhere deep within the stone, like something out of a dream, he heard it, the beat of a heart. He pulled away slowly, telling himself he had only imagined it. He didn't dare put his ear back to the stone. He began to retreat from the statue and head upstairs to his bedroom. It stopped a few steps steps away. What he did next, Ellison had no reason for. Turned timidly, approached the statue, and gave it a light kiss on the cheek. Realizing what he had just done, he abashedly hurried upstairs. It did not take him long to fall asleep. In his dreams, he saw a vision of a face he had not seen for an eternity. He felt an autumn breeze on his face as he walked down a sidewalk at Steadyfield Community College with a girl. She was quite plain, possibly a bit odd-looking, but she didn't care. Oh, but he didn't care. He still loved that girl. The vision shifted to much later. It was the same girl, but she was now unrecognizable. A vision of artificial beauty. As she walked away from his door, she turned back for a split second to say something. Her lips parted. Ellingson thought he knew what he was about to hear. He was wrong. May I presume you got my delivery? Came a voice Ellingson had not expected to hear. The vision melted around him and he saw Vendelia at the top of a short step ladder painting a mural. He looked around and, and saw that he was in a far different room than he had been in his previous dream. His first observation was the complete lack of exits. The second was a bizarre structure in the center of the room. Do you like it, Chuck? Asked the artist. It's my newest project, a sanctum of the Western Crossroads. Normally, old temples are the only place you'd find them, but I thought I'd make my own, even with a few personal touches. Ellison studied the object in the middle of the room. It was a pitch black signpost with arrows spiraling downwards in every direction. His eyes tracked the direction of the arrows and saw that each one pointed to a section of the wall that had been sectioned off. All of them were blank except for the one that Fidelia was currently painting. What does that mean? he asked. She hoped nimbly but she hopped nimbly down from the stepladder and landed without a sound on the stone floor. 
Crossroads are where you go when you die, Chuck, she said, walking towards the post in the middle. And then whatever afterlives you think you've earned show up on the arrows. She grabbed the post below the arrows and swung around it like a gleeful child. Oh, so many possibilities. Nocturne, Vice, the Silver Green. She pointed towards empty sections of wall she listed supposed afterlives. But this one is most interesting. She said, moving towards the section she had just finished painting. Ellingson followed her over to it. He saw an air he saw an aerial view of a great chasm carved into a gray, darkened wasteland. It ran in a jagged ring around a huge tableland filled with trees and greenery. It's like a paradise being kept away. Oh, what's wrong, person? It's like a paradise being kept away from the rest of the world, said Ellingson. Enthralled by the painting from deep within the chasm, blue and red light animated. This is perdition, said Vandalia. At least one of perceptions of it. Everyone there sees it differently, but the key is that it's a ring. It's infinity. She hovered a finger over the chasm, indicating the hint of blue light coming from its depths. You see, for every good thing you did in life, you get a period of your own personal paradise. In the red. Your own personal hell for all, all the bad things, she said, grinning. And then it repeats. So if you are a good person, Vendelia moved her finger along the chasm. The red turned to blue beneath her hand. You get a lot of good times. You can guess what happens to the bad guys, she said, moving her hand back and turning the light a burning crimson. What would your perdition be like, I wonder? All right, said Allison, not wanting to think about the question. What are you and what am I supposed to do with the statue in my house? I'm an artist, Chuck. In Vidalia, the feigned exasperation. As for your little angel, I left you a note, didn't I? Don't tell me the big, important doctor didn't figure it out. It means you entirely wasted a day. Now you'll have to hurry up. Just tell me, yelled Ellingson. He grabbed the girl by the arm and spun her towards him. Whether she was just a dream or something else, he was becoming sure she wasn't quite human. He immediately regretted his actions as the large woman in front of him shook his, his hand off and in an instant had her hand around his throat. He felt his feet lift off the ground as Medelia loomed a larger in front of him than he would have thought possible. She pressed his back to the wall, dead in the center of the landscape of perdition. He had heard that you did not feel pain in a dream. That was true. It was no dream. Her fingers dug into his neck as he grasped for air. His lungs failed, flailed helplessly, finding no respite. The artist holding him leaned closer, the infuriating grin never having left her lips. Bad move, Chuck, said Vendalia. In my studio, I run the show. Understand? He nodded as best as he could. Excellent. She dropped him to the ground, for he collapsed in a heap, gasping for breath. He had been right. She wasn't human. As for your question, as for your question, she said, I guess I'll have to tell you, it wouldn't be spot sporting of me to leave you clueless. What do you put into your work, Chuck? Time, he muttered, rubbing his neck gingerly. Effort, resources. Think more metaphorically, she said. More physically. She bent down, rubbing one finger over his forehead. He recoiled at her touch. 
He waved a finger in front of his face. He saw a glint of moisture and he suddenly understood. Sweat, he said, and blood and tears, she said. I'll give you the last, I'll give you the last one as an apology for the unpleasantries there. I may have been a bit hasty. Chuck, you seem like an alright guy for the most part. She extended a pale hand to, down to him. He ignored it and struggled to his feet. So I have to put blood, sweat, and tears in, onto the statue? He asked. Yep, she replied. She replied. Put enough into her and she'll turn human. She'll be your perfect woman, made especially for you by the greatest artist to ever exist. Me. It can't be from you, of course, and you can't kill anyone. That would encourage the wrong behavior. People slashing the wrist and all that messiness. And I have four days. Three now. What happens after that? He asked, barely wanting to know. Well, then your little angel crumbles to dust and you'll have nothing left. She said with a sigh. Nothing but a mess to clean up and the mark of Eden on your soul. The hell is the mark of Eden? He asked, a chill running down his spine. Maybe I'll tell you next time, said Vendelia. See you soon, Chuck. She snapped her fingers and lights went out. Ellingson might have imagined it before an instant. He thought he could still see a streak of red animating from the mural on the wall. Charles Ellingson woke up the next morning feeling as though he'd been hit by a truck. Like the day before, he told himself it was just a dream. But the tremors, tremors in, in his voice and, and, his, and his hand made it plain that he was beginning to doubt it was just in his head. Shifting to the side of the bed, he felt a sharp pain in his neck. He, early, he hurried out of the bed and, and into the bathroom, looking at his neck in the mirror. While there was no obvious wounds, he noticed a few red marks on his throat. They had not been there before. They looked like they had come from fingernails. After getting ready for work, he steadied himself before heading downstairs. He hoped he had just imagined getting the statue the day before. Maybe he would go down and there would only be an empty tile in his entrance hall. He knew that it would be best, but a small voice deep down told him that he wanted it all to be true. If it required blood, sweat, and tears, so be it. Allison quickly silenced that voice and went downstairs. There, just as it had been all of yesterday, was an alabaster statue waiting for him. His heart sank in his chest as he tried to avoid looking at it. As he moved towards the door, he had almost avoided it, but as he opened the door and went close and went to close it behind him, his gaze landed square on the face of the statue. He froze in place. For a moment, he saw her as if she was really alive. Snow white hair would be a fiery red. Her skin would be pale, yes, but perhaps not as pale as alabaster. If her eyes open, they would be sea green. No, they would be like emeralds, maybe a light blue. Noison shook himself out of, his, out of his reverie and slammed the door shut, harder than necessary. He saw his neighbor across the street give him an odd look as he also left for work. Left for work. Noison just smiled nodded and waved. Everything was perfectly normal, even though it was not. The day in the plastic surgery center went by quickly. Most of his cases were purely superficial, but there was one patient that had been there for minor facial reconstruction following a car accident. That was the sort of case that kept Allison going, even if half of his job was giving wealthy clients larger breasts. There were also the people that actually needed help. As he left for the gym, he mused that those people might be the blue in, in his perdition. He pushed the thought out of his head immediately. There was no such thing as perdition. Normally, Ellingson spent about an hour in, in at, the, at the gym after work. But that day, he did not particularly want to go home. After two and a half hours, he was sore, exhausted, and had to be kicked out at closing time. 
The next to the last occupant of the gym was a short girl with a heavy, flake, fake tan. Oniston had her pegged as some kind of sorority girl as she was wiping down the equipment she had just gotten off of. Her cell phone began playing a loud pop song ringtone. Oniston raised an eyebrow as she answered the phone, grabbed her things, and scurried out of the gym, all while carrying a loud, animated conversation with whoever was on the phone. As he was getting ready to leave, he noticed that the girl had forgotten her towel and left it draped over the equipment. He deliberated between calling after her to tell her, to tell her and just leaving it so someone else could deal with it. He settled on a ladder and packed up his things. Just about to leave when the dream from the night before it came back to him. The entire time he had been working out, he had been able to force everything from the previous two days from his mind, but it all came flooding back. What had that Tall, creepy woman said again, blood, tears, and sweat. Ellison looked back at the soiled towel draped over the seat of the side, while the two competing trains of thought bat battled in his head, his eyes scanned the area. There was for a moment no one watching, seeing no one. One side of the argument won out. He quickly grabbed the towel and walked out of the gym. He feared it would only take a small amount of sweat to prove that dreams were were a complete fiction, then he could safely ignore them, knowing he was safe from any kind of consequence, any kind of mark. When he got home that night, he threw his gym bag on the ground, bypassed the statue in his entryway, and acted as though everything was normal. He made a light dinner, cleaned up, looked over some case notes after watching the evening news, news and prepared to head upstairs to bed. On the foot of the stairs, he stalled, he tests the statue tomorrow, he had decided, or maybe he'd do it the next day. He had already put his foot on the first step when he pictured the icy blue eyes, long black hair, and suggestive grin waiting for him when he closed his eyes. He had to do it now. He had to be able to prove it was all bullshit before he went back to the Garden of Eden. Ellison steeled himself and walked over to his gem bag. A scent of sweat hit him as he opened it. For a moment, he thought he might just wash the contents of the bag and be done with it. That moment was very fleeting. He grabbed the damp towel and marched over to the pale sculpture in the center of his entryway. He looked it over again and fell asleep, the beauty, the beauty of it. His heart beat loudly in his chest. Finally, with a decisive stroke, he swept the towel over the frozen snowy hair. He let the cloth hang at his sides as he as he stared, for a moment nothing happened. He began to shake his head and turn away, knowing it was a farce when he noticed something impossible. A pale stone he had touched with the towel slowly turned to off white, then it turned pink. Finally, it turned a vivid crimson. Ellison's entire body trembled as he thought the cloth to the statue again. He sprayed it over wildly and touched it to the figure's hair, as if he was drying it, removing it. it the burst of stone hair slowly turned red, like a fire spreading throughout the stone forest. Looking closely, he could see that the hair still stood rigid like stone, even as a fiery red ran across the hair, falling down her back, with his hands shaking almost uncontrollably. He raised the towel above her in two hands and wrung it. A stream of sweat, far more than he would have expected, fell onto the alabaster form. As the liquid struck her, the hair softened and fell like water around her face. Allison's breath caught in his throat as a drop ran down her forehead and over one eye. It continued down her face like a teardrop. Where it ran, the stone turned from ivory to the color of flesh. Ellison's courage finally broke and he jumped back from the stone form. His back struck a pillar and he began to breathe heavily, his head spinning. He could see the statue's hair flowing in some impossible breeze. He could not believe it. It couldn't be real. As he continued to hyperventilate, the world around him grew fuzzy. His eyelids lowered with an angel in front of him. Darkness took him. Another vision of past came to him in his dreams, walking into a classroom at Steedville Community College, shaking hands with a man that would quickly become his mentor, thinking that perhaps not being able to afford going to his dream college wouldn't be so bad after all. 
The village shifted to the future where he saw the same professor being led away in handcuffs by the police. It was never made public exactly how much he had stolen from the college, but rumors set the number very high. Ellingson made eye contact for a fraction of a second before turning away and storming it into the lecture hall. The room he entered was very definitely not the one he remembered from school. A now familiar figure loomed in front of him. Who are you? He asked, his voice feeling that he was ready to believe the answer. I'm Vindalia, she replied. I don't think you have forgot my name already, Chuck. She smirked and walked away. Ellingson re realized he was back in the workshop she had originally taken him to. The artist himself had approached one with the half-finished statues in the center of the room and began to work on it with a chisel. You know what I mean, he asked, catching his breath and approaching her. What are you? I'm glad you at least got her hair done, said Vendelia, ignoring him. I mean, that red. It would have been a shame if you never seen that. You really have got to see the backside of her, though. Talk about a masterpiece if you don't say so myself. What are you? screamed Ellingson his voice echoing through the workshop like thunder. What is this freak show? Mendelia's expression turned sour at the outburst. Fear replaced anger in him immediately. He should not have done that. If you're going to be rude, said Mendelia, I'll have to teach you a thing or two. With a swift motion from her hand, a vine running along the wall snapped off of the surface and whipped towards him, wrapping around his wrist. Meyer flicked his other hand was caught in the same manner. Within seconds, his body was entangled in vines and being lifted off the floor. Even through the terror, he couldn't help but be thankful there was no hand around his throat. I am, I am an artist, said Mandelia, moving towards him. She seemed to grow larger with every word and every step. I was a Greatest shaper, I was the greatest shaper of flesh in the entirety of the frozen garden. Her skin began to grow paler and more like stone. I am the hand of Eden. He could tell how tall she had become. But she stood eye to eye with him, dangling in the air of workshop. I am the aspect of creation. At her last word, the flesh that had become so much like stone, fractured cracks, spreading like a web, the noise echoing through the workshop. From the crevices across her skin, small veins began to emerge. Her hair, long enough to reach the floor, began to move of, it, of its own accord. Ellingson, usually a bastion of reserve, let loose a scream that could not be contained. A lock of jet black hair shot upwards and wrapped around him, face suffocating his Rise. The aspect put a finger to her cracked lips and quietly shushed him. I told you, she said. I'm in charge here. Please be quiet. The lock of hair released from his head and lightly flowed back towards the floor. I understand your surprise. But I'm not going to hurt you. Well, except for the thing last time. And the vines might be a bit tight. Sorry. What the hell does this does that mean? Whispered Ellingson, careful not to raise his voice. The aspect of creation? Washer's voice rubbed her chin for a moment, meandering away from him. That, she said, is a long answer, but I think we have time. She turned back towards him and crouched down, resting on her Punches. He couldn't help but notice that her clothes, which had been baggy before, now stretched taut over her entire form. You see, Chuck, there used to be cities, and there used to be living gods in those cities. Then the gods died. Very sad. She got up and circled a statue of an Andronis figure. Then it had to be one of the gods she was talking about. Then something brought the gods back, back to a sort of half-life. 
and to keep this half-life going, they needed souls. How do you get souls? said Ellingson, barely audible. That's where the aspects come in, she replied. We go around looking for people who want to play our games, or in my case, wait for them to come to us. He remembered the number that he had drunkenly called, hoping for his perfect partner. And once they have agreed to the test, they're pretty much our playthings. Sometimes people pass the test, they get to keep living their little lives, sometimes with a parting gift. The ones that fail, the mark of a god is stamped onto their souls, said Vendalia, her voice somber. And we die? He asked. The aspect smirked. Eventually, yes, she, she said. But surprisingly, most aspects just let you keep on living. You'll die one day. And when that happens, the mark makes your soul go right to the Eden, or Sotrus, or Satanatus, whoever. And the shadow gods keep going and going and going. Mendelia snapped her fingers, the vines around Ellingson let loose all at once. He dropped to the ground but landed on his feet, barely keeping his balance. Looking up, he found the aspect bent down, huge blue eyes a foot away from his breath caught in his throat. Any more questions, Chuck? What happens then, said Ellingson, forcing the words from his mouth. What happens without a soul? Oh, Chuck. She said, shaking her head and bringing a finger up towards her, his chin. You don't really want to know. The tip up of her finger cracked open and a vine extended from it. The winding plank crawled up his jaw a line and around his neck like a snake. His courage, already near his breaking point, finally vanished. She tore the vine from Around his neck, he ran. Adrenaline fueled him as he sprinted out of the workshop and into the gauntlet of statues. The eyes of statues followed him as they flew by, shifting in stone faces and driving him onward. His heart felt like it was about to beat out of his chest as he reached the end of the hallway and raced through the entrance hall filled by statues with dead faces. He saw a wooden door at the other side without a second thought. He threw it open and stepped out into the dead world. Ellingson found himself in a monstrous cavern. The sound of thundering water echoed off of frozen stone walls. High above him, the roof of the space looked like solid ice. Allowing cold blue sunlight through softly lighting the cavern. Below his feet, he can could feel a half rotted planks of wood looking down he could see through the holes of an ancient boardwalk and into an infinite abyss below as a crack appeared in the wood beneath his feet he jumped backwards and into the doorway of a studio forgetting the danger and praying for solid footing From that relative safety, he gazed out into the dimly lit city. It became apparent that the building he had just vacated sat on a huge elevated platform hanging above a gaping sinkhole. His eyes followed a great waterfall up the, war the wall of the pit into an underground riff river flowing through a crumbling metropolis. Stone towers rose up towards an icy ceiling, cascading tributaries wove their way through the ruins, and there on an island at the very center of it all, a brilliant emerald garden sprouted in a faint light of the frigid grotto. As he looked more carefully, Ellingson saw that every flower, branch, and blade of grass was coated in a layer of shimmering ice. Hmm? I stopped hearing you. What? I stopped hearing you. Okay. Where? But I did hear the what. Heard what? I heard you say what. Uh... 
I guess that means Discord stopped doing whatever it was doing. Sorry. I don't see where I said what. After I poked you, you said what? Oh. So literally after you stopped reading, it stopped misbehaving. Oh, okay. And I don't know why that frustrates me. Sorry. Do I need to reread anything? Uh... When you got to the island outside the ice, something about a blade of grass started cutting on and off there, so... Uh... Alright. Hold on. And there on an island at the very center of it all, a brilliant emerald garden sprouted in a faint light of the frigid grotto. As he looked more carefully, Ellingson saw that every flower, branch, and blade of grass was coated in a layer of shimmering ice. Behold, said a familiar voice from behind him, the frozen garden of earthly delights, the ancient city of Eden. Ellingson knew he should be afraid. He knew he, sh he should probably be running out onto that boardwalk and into the dark, frozen city. But he had just noticed shapes moving along the ruins, shapes that shouldn't be moving. They weren't all human. What are those things? said Ellingson, not daring to turn around. The wealth of Eden is in magical stones, said Vendelia. Her voice teemed with disturbing unease, came from from a lower point than he expected. They were said to hold power of one of the makers of the universe, life itself. When used on flesh and blood, the stones could heal almost any alignment short of death. When used on a statue, it could breathe life. It could breathe life into the very stone. Why do they look like that? At first, you see, they were used to, by a great artist she said. They made living art greater than anything ever seen. Then, as things always do, they were used for darker, stranger things. Like what? You're standing in the red light district of Eden, Chuck, said Medelia. The stone brothels of Eden can make anyone with money anything they desired and then bring it to, it to life. My God said Ellison, noticed several of the shapes of the bridges connecting the solid ground with the floating platform. He could see them much more clearly. He wished he couldn't. Some he could tell were bizarre works of art. Others he could see were created as nightmarish sex dolls. A horrifying few could have been either. Do you remember how I told you the gods are now dark versions of themselves? Asked Vendelia. Yes, he replied, his voice quaking. Most of them cast dark shadows while they were, were still living. Ellison barely heard her. A huge construct had come around the corner of Vendelia's studio and moved towards them, towering above them, eyes, mouths, and appendages covered. A pillar of living stone. I think that's enough, don't you? The sun shining through the ice above him went dark for a moment. He could still hear the thunder of the waterfall and the shuffling of stone. That was not quite stone. Ellingson came to on, on the floor of his entryway, his entire body aching. He saw the puddle of sweat on the cold tile, feeling something digging into his back. He reached beneath him and pulled out a hammer that was still sitting on the floor. He tossed it across the room. It had to stop. Whatever was happening to him had to stop. He wouldn't survive any more nights like this. He forced his eyes open and he saw an alabaster statue with crimson hair sitting in the center of the floor. There was only one way to stop it. He finally believed. That day at work was like a blur. He was sure at the end of it that he had 
done at least two surgeries and had met several people, but damned if he could remember any of it. Reality was like a blur. It was like a real world it was a, a dream now. Those minutes or hours in the stationery and at this city beneath the ice felt so much more real. But he still had a job to do, one that had nothing to do with the living. It was the only thing that was important. At this center closed that night, and I sent remained behind. He waved the nurse's receptionist goodbye. His assistant, Indra, gave him an odd look, knowing that it was unlike him to stay late. She stalled at, as the other employees left and approached him an instant they were alone. I noticed something bothering you, Dr. Ellingston, she said. Something serious. You know I'm always here if you need to talk to anyone. She said closer to him to put a hand on his shoulder. Looking into her dark blue eyes, the doctor almost gave in and told her everything. Maybe someone else in the real world told him just how crazy he was. It would break the spell hanging over him. Instead, he brushed her hand off of him and turned to walk back to his office. Why are you like this? Kendra said from behind him, the stain strained in her voice barely contained. All I try to do is help you, Charles. Silence hung in the room for half a minute before he turned back towards her and spoke. Do you know why I became a plastic surgeon, Miss Goodson? He asked after getting the reply. Other than a blank stare, he continued. I had a girlfriend back in school that was quite plain, to say the least. I was happy. She wasn't. She got a lot of work done one summer. Came out looking like a model. Someone else altogether, but she was happier. I thought I could do the same thing and make people happy like that. You do that, said his assistant. Come to the end of last semester, right before I started my residency, it all fell apart. Turns out she'd been cheating on me for years. For a while, I blamed a new face. That's your big revelation? Asked Kendra. Never trust the pretty ones. No, said Allison, because whatever she turned into was there all along, with or without the face. The lesson is not to trust anyone. With that, his assistant sneered, spun around, and marched out of the office. As she made her way to the parking lot, Allison reflected on the part he had and said, the part that really drove the point home during that last night. He told her she was the same as his professor after he stole all that money. Out on the sidewalk, she stormed out. She spun around and threw one last dagger. Who do you think paid for all of this? She had asked, motioning to her face. As soon as the taillights to the last car had disappeared down the street, he made his way to their blood storage. As he opened the refrigerator, he eyed the bags of blood hungrily. He felt like some sort of vampire or ghoul, but desperate measures had to be taken. As he felt the cool air strike him, he began to pull out the plastic bags of, bags of crimson liquid and place them gently into the gym bag he had brought with him. He knew he couldn't take too many or someone would quickly notice, but he couldn't take too few. He had to finish this tonight. He couldn't take any chances. He couldn't have to go back to that cursed studio any more than need be. He stopped after taking three of the bags out. Would it be enough? I wonder how many variables could be in play. What if someone had died and it did nothing? He swallowed hard and grabbed the fourth bag. His eyes flitted over the contents of the refrigerator one last time as he closed it, hoping it was enough. Pulling himself away from the blood store, she grabbed his gym bag and walked briskly towards the exit of the building. It was not long before he was back in his home and paranoid took over again. He closed the blinds on every window in the house. He turned on exactly the right number of lights it took to look as though he was simply having a normal relaxing evening, not wanting to be disturbed. He thought about turning off his phone. But would that seem suspicious if someone called him? 
He briefly thought about how he would explain how he met the strange woman who was suddenly living with him. He couldn't just hide her inside the house. He had to see, see her in the sunlight. As a hundred questions swirled inside his head, he finally made his way back to the entrance hall, where, sitting on the tile around his angel, were four black bags of blood. He gripped the chef's knife in one hand, deciding that subtly had gone out the window at this point. He knelt in front of the statue that would soon not be a statue. It was more than freeing this girl from the stone. It was more than preventing his soul from being consumed by a half-dead god. It felt like his redemption. It felt like what his entire life had been leading to, slowly, dramatically, like a ritual in a long ruined temple. He lifted the knife, then the first bag of blood, and slashed through the top. He lifted the open bag above the alabaster form and poured. The blood seeped down through the crimson hair and over the stone face. As it did, Allison saw the liquid begin to absorb into the stone, disappearing within seconds. The face that aside from that thin streak had just been pure white was now the color of pale skin. Being unable to resist, he put a finger to one cheek. It still felt like stone. He grabbed the next bag. At the second application of blood, the change in color continued down the torso of the statue. The hands folded over her heart, looked almost alive. Half of the thin robe she wore had changed to a light gray. Ellison had to resist touching her again. There was still too much stone, too much that could be damaged. Please, he whispered softly to the empty room. Please let this work. Again, he slashed open the plastic bag and lifted it over the statue as the crimson droplets ran down the stone skin once again. Her legs barely visible beneath the flowing robe lost their ivory tone. The robe itself began up. The robe itself brightened into a bright silver, shimmering in the light of chandelier high above the entryway. Ellison backed away and took in the form in front of him. The snowy white of the alabaster had been completely erased. The only colors remaining were the pale tone of the skin and the shiver of her garments and the brilliant red of her hair. The doctor grabbed the final bag of blood off the ground and slashed it open, his heart beating like a drum. As soon as the stream touched the statue, the crystal clear transformation flowed like water from top to bottom. The stone gave away as the flesh softened and the fabric of the robe draped. Fluttering to the floor, Ellison backed away as the stone cheeks flushed with color. He knelt on the floor in front of his angel and washed her eyes, waiting for them to open at last. He waited and waited and waited. Nothing was happening. Ellison's entire body quaked, panic inches from setting in. He pulled himself closer and brought his face close to the hands folded across her chest. He slowly turned his head and placed his ear on them, listening closely. He could feel that the outer surface had turned to flesh, but just beneath it there was still unyielding stone. That was not what he was searching for. From much nearer than before, just beneath the surface, a heart softly beat. He frankly looked around him on the floor, praying that one of the bags still contained even a droplet of blood. He grabbed one after another, gazing at the clear plastic and gasping them and grasping them as if they're squeezed the blood from nothingness. The final bag fell to the floor with a dull plop, and the panic finally came. Whatever strength Ellison had left in his legs left all at once, and he fell to the floor narrowly, avoiding hitting the figure, standing vigil in the center. A nonsensical babbling left his mouth as he stared up at the shining crystals of the chandelier above. He could feel the last day closing in. Anything that could happen that would ruin everything. He might get arrested for stealing blood. He might be in a car accident. Hell, he could even oversleep. His eyes jumped from the light above the pale-faced statue hovering over him. If the peaceful countenance, even as motionless as stone, brought him back to the symbols of sanity. He did the only thing he thought might help. I'm sorry, muttered Ellison to the girl beside him. I'm sorry I didn't bring you to life, and forgive me, right? He almost thought he could see a flicker of motion, of ascent, 
course you can, he said. You're an angel after all. He took a deep breath and panic began to subside. The story of my life, you know, said Ellison. Nothing's ever good enough. Always one step away from perfect. I don't want to be a plastic surgeon in the beginning. I wanted to be a heart surgeon. I wanted to save thousands of lives and be that doctor. Everyone wants to be their doctor. He stayed there lying on the floor and looking up at the closed eyes. Top of my class, he said. Not that I... Not that it's hard in Steadville, but still, I got accepted to Johns Barron's University. I had everything in the palm of my hand. Everything except money. My parents said it was too expensive and the Steadville Community College would give me a full scholarship. I get, guess where I ended up? Right back in this pit of, of a town that I wanted out of. And I soon finally picked himself off the floor and sat there beside the statue. The wavering in his hands and voice had almost left entirely. And after everything that happened, the scandals, the drama, the bullshit, where do you think was the only thing place that would hire me? That's right. The prodigal son returns. He reached out to touch her again, but thought better of it. I should give you a name, said Ellison. But not yet. When you open your eyes and see me, the first thing I'll do would be to give you a name, I promise. That he stumbled upstairs and headed for bed. If he had listened closely, he might have heard a, the beating heart beneath the alabaster flutter when he mentioned giving her a name. Ellison wasn't afraid when he found himself back in Videlia's sanctum of the crossroads. It was past fear. He stormed through the room towards where she was putting the finishing touches on the bottom of a mural back to the form he had originally met her in. He noticed that every other space on the wall was already painted. You're really close there, she said without turning, taunting him half-heartedly. Why do I suspect that it's not a coincidence that I was that close to making her real? Are you accusing me of something? asked Vendelia. Of course not, said Ellison, arms crossed and eyes defiant. So back to normal. No stone skin, no vines. Would you like that? Asked the girl, turning around and gently putting down her paintbrush. No, I don't particularly like doing that. It's only for effect once in a while. He walked over to him and turned around, admiring the finished painting. And what's this one? He asked. Glory gone, she said softly. They are for life of heroes, kings, and saints. The mural depicted a shining gilded sheet lined with elaborate flat palaces and enormous mansions, all pure gold, all sitting beneath a pitch black sky. I like it better than perdition. I'll give you that. Oh, wrong on one. I like it better than perdition. I'll give you that, said Ellingston. Got a chair? I think I'll just close my eyes and wait to wake up this time. Vendelia smirked briefly and then produced a small step ladder. Will this work? She asked. There was something different about her compared to the previous visits. She seemed more human. Works for me, said the doctor. Thanks. Now mention it, said the artist and he took a seat. For a moment, both of them were silent. Only said glanced over once more at the newest painting. It was gorgeous. I wanted to go to Galorigan, said Vendelia quietly, sitting on the floor and leaning against the signpost, the center of the floor. That's why me and my sister came to Eden, to be the greatest artist of all time to find our glory. You're human? asked Ellison, shock in his voice. In Eden? All aspects were human once, she said. And I was an artist, but my sister was always better than me. The critics loved her. They said she was the greatest, and no matter how well I did, I got judged against her. Her paintings were, were the most insightful. Her statues were the most flawless, so I made a change. You stopped being an artist? He asked. Not really, she replied. 
I packed up shop in the art district and moved to the center of the platform here. I started the greatest stone brothel Eden has ever known. I may not have been able to make things as pretty as my sister, but I can make things that people wanted. I can make things that people would, would pay for. So while she was busy being a great starving artist, I was over here ranking in money for giving people whatever freakish thing they, they desired. Was it worth it? Asked Ellison. The girl deliberated for a moment before answering. Maybe I still could have found a way to glory gone, she said. Maybe I could have looked Eden in the eye and told her I wouldn't help her take souls. Maybe I, I could have, have asked for help. She swallowed hard. It wasn't worth it. The silence hung in the air. Allison asked the question she added, answered the last time he needed to know. What happens if I lose my soul? She reaches, but she closes her eyes, sighed, and smiled darkly. When you reach the western crossroads, part of your soul is the price you pay to gain entrance to, the, to an afterlife. Same part that the gods consume under the mark. And if you can't pay the price, there's only one path open. What is that? Asked, asked Ellison, already knowing full well. Perdition, said Vendelia. And for people that seek out the aspects, especially those that fail their test, perdition is rarely merciful. Gods help me, he whispered. The gods don't help anyone anymore, she said. Those days vanished 12,000 years ago. And what about you? Asked the doctor. I've helped too much already, said Vendelia. Eden doesn't like losing souls. Go, Dr. Ellison. Go back home and get your angel, and maybe look into a new profession. You don't seem very happy right now. That morning, Ellison woke up feeling more rested than he had in years. He was still nervous, of course. He would be cutting this time close, but at least he had hope. He had purpose. Fear was a distant memory as he got ready for work and headed to the door. As he passed the figure in the entryway, he gave a small kiss on the cheek and whispered farewell. Perhaps soon he would get a reply while doing the same thing. He was cautious entering the center, watching the eyes of the employees. He wanted to make sure no one was watching him out of the corner of their eye. If they had caught him stealing blood the night before, all bets were off. But making his way to his office, he was greeted normally by everyone. As he sat down at his desk, he was already looking forward to leaving that night with one final prize. Then there was a brisk knock at the door. Come in, said Ellison, forcing his voice to be steady. His assistant, Kendra, entered the office and quickly closed the door behind her. Ellison's blood went cold. One of the nurses noticed that there was that we seem to be missing a few units of blood this morning, doctor. She said, a gleam in her eye told him that this was not going to go well. So I thought to myself, who do I know that has been acting oddly all week? Rage began to build in Ellison's chest. He should have fired this girl a long time ago. So I took a peek at the security tapes from last night and guess who I saw going to and from the blood storage with a big bag. There's an explanation for that, I can assure you, said Ellingston, trying to come up with an explanation. Then in an instant, a plan came to him. He would have to play it perfectly, but he would he could salvage the day, he thought. I'd love to hear it, said Kendra. Or else, I might have to turn you in, unless, of course, you can make it worth my while not to. He suddenly felt no qualms about his new plan. If you must know, he said, I've been experimenting with a new treatment at home that can almost reverse any the effects of aging. I need blood samples to test my theory on. If it works, I'm going to make millions on it. You can't tell anyone. Seeing the look in her eyes, he had no doubts that this was going to work. I want in, she said. 
or else I'm turning you in for stealing medical supplies. If this works, no one would care about a few packs of blood, he countered. Get out of my office. I'll tell them you're sexually harassing me, she said. I say we're sleeping together. No one here will believe you. It doesn't matter if they do, said Kendra. When the authorities come in, it'll be my word versus the thief's. You won't even be able to stomach what I'm doing, said Ellison, his voice like ice. Try me, she said. Let's go see it. Now? Yes, now, she said. I'll follow you to your house. Ellison sighed and got up, a metaphorical gun to his head. Two of them ex exited the office and headed for the exit. As they went to their surgeon's desk, the doctor briefly told him to cancel his appointments for the next hour. It might be longer than that if things went according to plan behind him. Kendra leaned over and whispered into the receptionist's ear. We've got some business to attend to, she said, winking. Ellison saw her plan. She wanted everyone to know that they had left together in the middle of the day. If he really did have a memory, uh, if he really did have a money-making treatment, it built up her extortion scheme. If she had happened to disappear, well, he'd be the only suspect. It was a smart plan. In fact, there was only one flaw in it. She didn't know he had nothing to lose. Nothing except his soul. She followed him back to his house in her car. She had apparently had time to plan this out and did not trust him to ride in the same car. Accidents could happen. As they exited their vehicles and headed for the door, she got a final jab. It would be her last. Remember Charlie. She said, making his blood simmer. If anything happens to me, they'll know it is you. So just let me see what this million dollar idea is. We can get on with our lives, okay? She'll be right inside, said Ellison, holding the door open. Ladies first. Kendra gave him a doubtful look, but assured in her plan, she stepped into the entryway. Only a square of light from the door was illuminated. The window blinds are still shut tight. She took a few steps inside. You have lights in here, right? She said impatiently. Which way is it? Right in front of you, said Ellison, flicking on the lights and shutting the door behind them. He suddenly clicked the lock and the entrance hall was suddenly illuminated. As Beauty stood perfectly still with hands folded, only feet in front of Kendra, her jaw dropped slightly in disbelief. This is your stupid project, she yelled. This is a statue. This is... Her voice caught in her throat as she studied it further. She had initially seen it as a normal st statue due to its stillness. But as her eyes made her way down her form, Ellison knew she was seeing the softness of, her, of the skin. And the silver all sway swaying in the air. She was so awestruck by it that she didn't hear the faint sound of metal scraping tile. What is this, Ellison? said Kendra, her voice hushed. Is this a real girl? Why is she like that? She turned around to find the doctor with a, with a chef's knife leveled at her throat. The blade was still stained by a few drops of, of dry blood. The steel glinted in the light. That is my angel, he said. And now you're going to head into the kitchen and we're going to talk. Kendra's eyes went wide as she saw the intensity in his eyes. She had no idea what was going on anymore. Her plan had fallen apart. The doctor led her into his kitchen and made her sit in one of the high-backed chairs. He swiftly opened a drawer and grabbed a roll of twine, the only thing he could think of. As fast as he could, he grabbed her arms, yanked them behind the chair, and tied them as toughly as he could. I apologize for my poor hospitality. But you have really put me in a blind bind here, he said, not intending to, the pun, but snickering nervously anyways. You see, this is the last day I have to make her real. I've done so much already, but I need more. More what? Blood, sweat, or tears, said Ellingson. I'll take what I can get. I don't suspect I have much time thanks to your little act. He grabbed the back of the chair and dragged 
her into the entrance hall a couple of meters from the angel. All it would have taken was one more day, but you could not leave well enough alone. His voice raised to a manacle pitch. You're insane, screamed Kendra. Blood is not going to make that thing come to life. She was stoned yesterday morning, said Ellingston, swinging around the chair and looking her dead in the eyes. Pure white stone. And look at her now. Tears had begun to well up in Kendra's eyes, fear and in inevitability settling in. They spun around towards motionless form. You could almost hear its heart beating in anticipation. She wasn't going to judge him for this. She knew it was necessary. She didn't want to crumble to dust. Where did you get that thing? In a dream, he said, speaking like it was in a trance. In an artist's studio in a faraway city in a dream they got it from a place where there are half-dead gods and living fetish statues and afterlives with golden streets he fell to his knees in front of the figure and looked at the still closed eyes i really need to think of the name first i don't suppose you have any suggestions eh turn around and give kendra a questioning glance and found the chair empty the kitchen twine bottom floor it was Billy really horrible with knots. Before he could act, a massive blow came from the back of his head. Lights exploded in his skull, and the world began to blur. He slumped forward, his arms flailing. He barely registered that one of his hands had lashed onto the wrist of the frozen angel. Blinding fear filled him as he tumbled backwards onto the floor, dragging her with him. He was almost ecstatic when the heavy weight of stone landed fully on his torso. He could feel at least one broken rib, but there was not a crack on her. The room was beginning to fade as he saw a hammer hit the floor out of the corner of his eyes. He saw Kendra hovering over him and his love, hands over her mouth. In a, s in a state of shock, as she stood shaking, tears fell from her eyes and landed in silver fabric. And final seconds before his vision faded to black, Ellingston felt the weight of stone on him light, lighten. He heard a breath being taken and a torso swell. He felt the, the fever beating of a heart that was not his own. And at that, in the last instant before the room dissolved entirely, he saw a flash of bright green eyes opening for the first time. The sorrow in them broke his heart. He awoke to a familiar studio with marble walls and climbing vines as he looked around. He was surprised to see that the massive stone blocks and half-finished statues were nowhere to be seen. Looking to the center of the room, he saw Vendelia leaning against a towering statue that he recognized immediately. It was the same one he had seen in an entryway each of his last four days. However, this one was still a snowy white. Well, said Vendelia, you got your girl, Chuck, she smirked coldly. I'm impressed. I'd be more impressed if you hadn't kidnapped a girl to do it, or if you hadn't gotten your skull broken in the process. But hey, credit is a credit where credit is due. That's it? Asked Ellison. I'm not mar I'm not marked? No. Nope. She said, licking a finger and wiping a blemish off the statue. You won. Eden, nothing. So why am I back here? I he asked. Have you taunted me enough? I just, I just feel kind of sorry for you, Chuck, said Vidalia. I wanted to offer my condolences. Why? he asked. Because I'm probably going to be locked up now. She'll wait for me. I know she will. Just let me out of this goddamn dream world so I can see her. Oh, she'll wait for you. I have no doubt about that, said the aspect looking at the far void in his gaze. But this isn't a dream. What is it? asked Ellingston, start turning as cold as the walls of Eden. You took a big shot to the head there, said Vidalia. You won't be waking up from this one. Wait, said. Wait, 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 wait. I doubt you'll survive much longer, she continued. So I thought I'd give you a memorial of your perfect woman. She backed away and threw both hands at the ivory statue in a dramatic fashion. This can't be happening said Ellison. I put too much into this. 
This was going to change everything in my life. It did, said Vidalia. Just not how you expected. I'll leave you two alone. The aspect of creation began to head for the door, leaving the doctor the image of his love, but stopped just at the threshold. Charles? What? He asked, faint while glimmering. Yeah, if you happen to see a blank sign on the western crossroads when you reach it. She began. Yes? Wait, said Vidalia. Just wait. Eventually she'll be along. The silver green will call. What does that mean? Said Ellenson, only to find himself alone in the studio with his statue. He stumbled over, feeling his head and ribs throb with pain. He knelt he leaned his head against the folds of the stone robe, he, and he screamed. He didn't stop screaming. In the hallway of the Steadfield Hospital, a police officer walked down the hall and nudged another that was waiting by the door to a patient room. How's the scumbag? He asked. Internal bleeding in his head, they think, by the second officer. Broken rib did something in his guts, too. They don't think it's going to last too much longer. Serves the best, right, said the first officer. Kim that's the girl who was having an affair with. Ties her up and threatens to kill her. Yeesh, how's the girl doing? She gave her... She, she gave her a and then went home about half a second later, said the, sec, said the second. Looks like she's seen a ghost the whole time. How does a piece of work like this guy get these girls? Girls? Uh, uh, girls? Yeah, the guy's girlfriend came in about an hour ago. He said, poor thing, looked like she had been hit by a train. She's still in there with him. Really, though. How's he got a girl like that? She looks like a goddamn angel. In the hospital room behind them, a slender figure stood vigil over the motionless form of Charles Ellingson. As he lay dying in the bed, the dim light of fluorescent bulbs illuminated her hair like fire. The flickering green of life support monitors shone off of the skin like alabaster. Moonlight flowing through the binds reflected off of eyes that glowed like emeralds. She didn't speak. She didn't touch him. She never learned how to mourn or comfort or console. She hadn't been alive that long. She just did what she had always done. It was the only thing she knew. She waited and watched and wished she had a name. The Strange Glow My grandfather has been acting very strange lately and has begun sleepwalking again. For this reason, it was suggested to me by my parents that I write a journal to keep myself busy and to keep track and document my grandfather's behavior here. They will be away in Europe for the next two weeks, so while they are away, my grandfather's well-being will be my sole responsibility. Now back to what I was saying. He's been very odd lately and has been displaying signs of dementia as well. He had been repetitively telling me that they are after him and that they will find him soon. As expected, I asked who they are to which he has two responses, I don't know, while the other response is complete silence and confusion. These are obvious signs of paranoia. I know a psychologist, but I can imagine these thoughts are coming from a place of both age and trauma. Trauma in the form of war, for he survived World War II as a dive bomber fighting the Japanese and experienced much combat and lost many friends. After the war, he continued to serve in the Navy as a training pilot in the Florida Keys, oftentimes going through the Bermuda Triangle, the Caribbean, and the Gulf of Mexico for training purposes. He very suddenly spoke about it. It was as though he was trying to forget something, something he was still scared of, and expressed to no one. I wish he would tell me so I could be closer to him and be able to pass 
these stories down to the next generation of family. But for now, I will wait. I am hoping these next two weeks will bring us closer than ever before. I am going, I am going to eat dinner in a moment with him. Then I will write some more later. Then we'll write some more later. Dinner was very good, and we shared a glass of wine together. Everything seemed like it was going fine until a simple ray of light from the lighthouse several blocks down along the waterfront came through our windows and shined upon him. All at once, he went from talking about romantic city trips in Europe with Grandma to suddenly flinching and nearly trembling when a light touched him. He nearly fell out of his chair, which startled me. I got up at once and asked if he was okay and having an emergency, to which he denied and begged me to close the curtains immediately. Although I was confused, I did so as fast as I could. When I turned back to question him, he was gone. He had scurried to some other part of the home. After several moments of looking inside each room, I found him in the living room. All the drapes and curtains were shut as he sat upwards in his reclining chair, hidden in the darkness. I asked if he was okay, to which he responded, fine, just fine. Very quickly and dismissively, obviously something is wrong. I brought the rest of his dinner and wine to him and then returned upstairs to my room to write this entry. He's doing it again, waking up in the middle of the night. It's about 3.13 a.m. right now. I hear him walking back and forth, up and down the stairs, muttering to himself, I'm going to carefully check on him and come back. The experience was more than what I was ready for. I called out to him several times. But nothing had the desired effect. He still ran about the house aimlessly. I remember hearing or reading that you are not supposed to wake people while they are sleepwalking, as it can be dangerous to the sleepwalker and the waker. Well, let's just say it was just that dangerous. I lost track of my surroundings in the kitchen and accidentally got between the island and my grandfather. When he suddenly changed direction and brushed my way and crushed into me, he roared and yelled and even began to cry. I was so confused. We fell to the ground, but as we did, I fell in a way where he would fall on top of me so I could soften the impact for him. As I held him up, he flung his arms around wildly, yelling, No, no, I would repeat after he knocked over the spice rack. Along with plates and cups which crashed to the floor, he stopped at once and stood there in silence. As I froze, I then tiptoed to the next room and watched him, unsure what I should do and how I could help him. Another tense and quiet moment passed, and I watched him adjust and relax his posture. Michael? He spoke, almost trembling, in the dark of the kitchen. I didn't respond at first, as my heart nearly broke at the pain and confusion in the old veteran's voice. It sounded as though he was lost, a lost child rather than a former warrior of the sea. Michael, are you there, Michael? He said louder this time. Yes, Grandpa, I'm over here. He turned to me and went to me at once to embrace me. I'm sorry, my grandson. I thought I was. Was what? I interrupted. Being taken away. Taken away from where? Taken away where? I'm not sure, my boy. I'm not sure. Well, it's all right now. I then helped him back to his room. It's now 3.30 a.m. Today was a quiet day at first, but because of a bit of, of an anxious one at the news, we learned later, as the day progressed, we watched baseball on the television and then the news. 
there is a storm approaching in a few days. Many news and weather channels are predicting it will become a hurricane. Chances are it will hit us in full force. So my grandfather and I went to the supermarket and the gas station to avoid the impending chaos. The anxiety of the town is obvious. People are moving faster, more aggressively on the road. I am hoping that the storm will miss us and go around us at, as most storms do. I'm going to... I'm going to make dinner now. I'll write later. Dinner went well, and I made sure that the curtains of the window, which faces the lighthouse, were closed prior to inviting my grandfather to the dinner table to avoid another episode of whatever it was the previous dinner. During our meal together, I took it upon myself to ask him about his military experience. I was hesitant to ask, but I couldn't help my own curiosity, which at first I thought might be selfish. But then I realized maybe I could discover the sole source of his trauma, or at least his odd behavior. He started off simple and chronologically, discussing his training and the time in boot camp. But eventually, we got to the war, and surprisingly, the combat part. There was a mixture of pain, anger, confusion. And hope in his voice and tone. As he discussed the war, he was well composed, organized, and detailed when explaining everything the dates, the ships, the equipment, the scenery, the sensations, the fear. It was as though we were slowly being thrown back into the cockpit of a dive bomber plane, ready to free fall from the sky at a moment's notice. Through incoming and desperate fire, it was extraordinary to me. But then he began to discuss the aftermath of the war. I could not help notice his pace dramatically slowed down. He struggled to organize his thoughts now, and there was a worry in his voice. It was some frail voice that was nearly choked up and trembling when he was sleepwalking and when the lighthouse shined upon him. The very thing that caused this anxiety of his was the mentioning of the post-war events, much to my surprise, rather than the war itself. What specifically caught my attention was when he recalled that five planes, all of which were piloted by his friends. One day they had all gone suddenly missing during a navigation exercise. Fifth plane happened to be a rescue plane which searched for the previous four. Additionally, a sea vessel was lost as well, which my grandpa described as a work of art. Almost a living work of art, by the way. He referred to it as she or her. Now my grandfather was the second rescue plane at this time, and wingman to the other rescue aircraft. When I asked what happened to them? He took a long pause. He slowly rose and put his hands together behind his lower back and walked towards the windows of his of his home and gazed upon the open sea. I cannot say for certain, my grandpa answered. I'm sure you've heard stories about where I was. Oh, what? That's him. Never mind. I'm sure you have heard stories about where I was stationed. They have been told there for hundreds of years, he said. Mom and Dad said you were stationed in Florida, that's all. Yes, Florida indeed. But when we flew during carrier drills and exercise, I flew between Florida Keys, Bermuda, and Puerto Rico. Then famous and, and dreaded trigal cursed, no doubt, from centuries past. The Bermuda Triangle? I asked him. Yes, also no more appropriately as the Devil's Triangle. Both ships of the sea and planes of the air have perished there. I didn't find this strange in the least. Oh, whoops. I didn't find this strange in the least, so I asked. Well, don't planes and ships go missing all the time? Not like this, they don't, Grad son. This is different. The number of disappearance there is unique to any other region on the Earth. 
Those 27 highly trained military men I call my friends don't just vanish without a trace like that. I sailed on every ocean, flew in every sky, and I tell you, there is something wrong with that sea area. Something still left unknown and a hidden secret to mankind. I often wonder, maybe I was supposed to vanish with them. Nonsense, Grandpa. Your place is here, with me and your family. It was clear to me then, so much of the paranoia came from the years of conditioned superstition and from traumatic survivor's guilt. Survivor's guilt that makes you feel this way, Grandpa. Yeah, well, maybe, Grandson. You are safe here, Grandpa. Nothing can harm you here. We are neither at sea nor the sky. We are right here in our pleasant seaside town. You're right, boy. I apologize for getting worked up. This town will soon be made unpleasant with the approaching storm. Let's focus on that instead. We should get ready at once. He then grabbed his shoes and tossed mine over to me. We have no time to waste, he said it as he put his veteran baseball cap on and got his car keys. We then began on our way to the local supermarket and on the way we passed through the town where I saw an antique store that caught my attention. I'm thinking of tomorrow of going bike riding and stopping there. It's morning now, but I woke late last night to the sound of my grandfather yelling. At first, I thought someone broke into the house because what he verbalized made it seem as though he were fighting or arguing with another person. I got up to call the cops, but I forget where my phone was, so I grabbed one of the golf clubs from my bedroom corner and ran into his room where I surprisingly found him still asleep. Blanket was half on him and half tingled beneath him. He tossed and turned while yelling, You can't take me away! You can't take me away! Then he said things that sounded like coordinates and pilot di dictation, codes and numbers, call signs, etc. I watched him for a moment, still unsure as what to do, until I decided I should turn on the light with the hope it would perfectly peacefully break his dream and calmly wake him. However, when I turned the light, Hour when I turned on the light, he cried out in hysteria and rolled back and forth until he threw himself off the bed, thudding hard onto the floor. I ran to his side immediately and saw that he was now awake, calm and still. He looked confused but relieved. It was a dream. He looked at me, asking for confirmation. I could hear it in his tone. Yes, Grandpa, just a dream. No, my boy. Not just a dream, a nightmare. Do you want to talk about it? Are you hurt at all? No, and no, I am fine. I was unsure of what to say or do, but we looked at each other for a moment and appreciated each other's company for a few seconds. Tomorrow before lunch, let's go to church, my grandfather said. I wanted to please him, and so I told him, Yes, let's go. Before I returned to my room, I wonder why he wanted to go all of a sudden and bring him there, there with him. It's still late, and writing this is putting me to sleep. I'll write more tomorrow about the church and antique store. I'm still hoping to visit. We went to the church as planned. My grandfather and I didn't say much to one another. With the church, we were both very serious about faith and listened intently to the sermon. But one thing I took away was what my grandfather asked. Do you really think God exists? I don't understand why he was asking me this. It seemed heavy and out of nowhere. When I answered honestly and said, Yes, I do. He nodded and then bizarrely asked if I believed in ghosts, to which I said I, would not, I was not sure. 
What about the government? Do you trust the government? I'm not sure. I suppose for the most part, yes. Sometimes no. Right afterwards, he asked if I believe in extraterrestrial beings, to which I said I don't know. He then began to go on about how if God is real, then ghosts must be real. But he questioned how God would banish them to an existence in between life and death. To this statement, I didn't know how to respond. Now with aliens, he explained how every star in the sky is a sun. And each sun has planets and each planet has moons. And how basically with all of the infinite number of worlds out there, it was unlikely that our world was the only one that could sustain life. I still remained unsure as to why he was telling me this. Maybe he was trying to make a conversation, so I joked that perhaps there were alien ghosts on other planets, but this did not amuse him. In the next instant that followed, the priest blessed us. Go out into the world and go with God, and Mass ended. After Mass ended, my grandfather insisted we stay longer and pray, but I had to run out of things to pray for, so he advised me to pray for peace and calm. When everyone left, we still remained. At first, it was easy to respect my grandfather's wishes, but when things became awkward, I wa watched him with my eyes closed in silence. Michael, won't you pray with me? Repeat the words I say. I waited, unsure of what he, he would say, but eager to appease him and, and anxious to leave before the attic store closed. It closed early on Sundays. I then told him yes, and, and so I said the following with the grandfather. Thou, O Lord, who stillest and reign of the sea, hear, hear us, and save us that we perish not. O blessed Savior, who didst save the, thy disciples, ready to perish in a storm, hear us and save us. We beseech thee, Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. He slowly arose when he blessed himself and beckoned me to follow him. Once we were outside, I took my bike I had tied to a telephone pole on the main street. My grandfather had driven there separately. Will I meet you at home? He asked. I'm going to stop at the antique store. Okay, I'm going to read yesterday's paper. Once you get home, we will go to the grocery store again together. He looked intensely at the sky, which he remained, which still remained the blue Sunday. He then spoke, That store will be coming. We better prepare for the onslaught of people attacking the store. I remember telling him sure, and then proceeded to pedal to the antique store. When I arrived at the store, I was immediately drawn to the binoculars in the window. When the owner greeted me, I asked her right away the price of them. One hundred dollars exactly, she said. My parents had given me two hundred dollars for the ten days I was here, even though I had a job and was using vacation days. Uh, they're from my grandfather, I said. He's a World War II combat veteran. Fought in the Pacific. I think these are Navy issued. I'm sure he would love them. Are they World War II era? Yes, those were World War II era. And it was your grandfather. Uh, old man McCullen. Yeah, I know him. He's always wearing his veteran's cap. He's a legend in this town. A fine gentleman, the woman said. All right, send me five dollars for you, she said. That's very nice of you. It's a deal. Thank you, I told her. I was very excited. A surprise gift for my grandfather. I had every intention of giving them to him after we ate. When I got back home, we quickly made our way to the local supermarket, where each register was open and easily had a dozen people per line. The chit-chat was loud and audible, and the panic and haste was evident. 
Many couples and families went together and were shouting to each other blindly, communicating from aisle to aisle. Other people throughout the aisles were simply grabbing everything they could. Many were hoarding the paper products, others baby formula, while most went for milk, eggs, and bread. My grandfather leaned towards me and said, Don't follow those idiots grabbing the most perishable goods in the store. Go grab some pasta and rice and beans and a can. If we lose electricity or whatever the case may be, we will have things that to last without refrigeration. I, of course, followed my grandfather's guidance and did as he asked. When we were finished, my grandpa, my grandpa seemed agitated again. Let's go. We have enough. He rushed. I don't trust these people. Desperate people are the hardest to trust, and people in a panic are hardest to reason with. I simply nodded and we made our way out. The hours blended and seemed to pass quickly, and before I knew it, I was closing the shades and double, double locking all the doors of my grandpa's home. We had pasta with tomato sauce, and he had and he hard-boiled enough eggs to last a week in anticipation of the hurricane. He then went over to his record player and began playing a big band and jazz music from the 40s. He was quite quieter than usual, but his hands seemed as though they were trembling as he unwrapped a small candy. I broke the silence with an impulsive question, no doubt ruined the music as well. Have you gone to the doctor lately? What? Why is that? He responded. Well, you're, you're shaking a lot. Is it, is it early Parkinson's, or blood pressure, or diabetes related? He looked at me with surprise. Listen, kiddo, I survived World War II. If the Japs didn't get me, an extra caddy won't either. Are you worried anyone will get you? I asked again like an idiot, half realizing what I said. What did you say? He said defensively. It's just that you saw how panicked the people looked, I quickly said. It's not them I'm concerned about, he responded. Once again, I, was, I wasn't sure who he was referring to, and he hadn't been to the doctor recently. Who was to say he? it wasn't dementia or paranoia? I refrained again from pressuring him further and decided inside to calm the mood. Grandfather, you have survived my line of questioning, I joked. I think you deserve a bit of reward for that, I added. He laughed. And what is that? I got up from my seat and went over to my room. Quickly grabbed the box of binoculars and placed it over where my grandfather was seated. Facing me in the front door, the light of the setting sun outlining the closed black curtains, making them glow gold. What is this? This is a nice surprise. He commented as he opened the box. My lord. He paused, seemingly stunned and unsure how to respond. I haven't used these since, since. He struggled to find the words. I couldn't tell if he liked it or not as he was stuck on repeat. Since your time in the service, I added. Yes, it's a nice gift. He said as he fidgeted to return the binoculars. I didn't say anything, but I was most likely visibly disappointed. He tried to speak. My boy, I... He couldn't finish, but kept trying. It's just that the sun is setting. I, uh, I suppose I could use them really quick. Maybe spot a ship like I used to. He became satisfied in this moment. And thought maybe this is how... His weird habit of frankly closing the blinds would end. It didn't make sense why have a home on the shore with a beautiful view of the bay, the lighthouse, sunrays, and sunset, and not utilize it. Where does this phobia of the lighthouse come from? My grandfather rose from his chair, slowly turned from me, burst the curtains. He muttered something to himself and seemed to take a few deep breaths. Next, he raised the binoculars to his eyes and then gazed at the horizon. For a moment, all was still, still and silent. I watched him, not daring to move. 
word he was on the fridges of having an episode but at the same time my love for gift giving hoped that he would be able to relax his mind and enjoy the, his present for a moment i was right he laughed for a bit now and then as though he were a toddler with a toy but then for a reason unknown that laughter became near sobs and whimpering he banged the binoculars against the glass while his eyes were still fixed to them did this multiple times and spoke incoherently. Stop, Grandpa! Grandpa, stop! <coughs> I yelled at him, but it only got worse. I ran over to him and nearly ripped the binoculars from his face. No! He yelled, pushing me away, forcing me to the door. What is wrong? I shouted. He didn't yet. He yelled out, Look! As he accidentally hit me in the face with binoculars, Almost immediately giving me a small flat lip. Although I was aggravated, I took binoculars and looked towards the clouds on the horizon. They were dark as nightmares and seemed as thick as landmass, like a floating piece of light in the sky. I lost my temper for a moment as I shouted to him. It's just it's just storm clouds. I repeated to him what he had told me in the supermarket. That's where people are the hardest to trust, and people in a panic are the hardest to reason with. He calmed himself down and then threw the curtain closed. He apologized for his outbursts and for my lip. He gave me a hug and then said right before he ascended to the stairs to his room, It's outside the clouds now. It won't be long. I stood there with my heart still vibrating in my pounding chest from the outburst. It was only a storm, yet it was such a psychological strain on everyone in the town, evidently including my grandfather now. I spent the rest of the afternoon time napping, but soon awoke to the early twilight to the sound of Sinatra's version of stormy weather echoing through the halls up from downstairs. Don't know why there's no sun up in the sky storm weathering since my gal and i ain't together keeps running all the time the lyrics were dancing along the hallways room to room come on down my grandfather called when he saw me at the top of the stairs with a big smile on his face as i descended i noticed an assortment of grapes crackers and cheeses and a couple of glasses of red wine it was, this was no doubt his way of apologizing to me for his outbursts and at the same time creating an atmosphere so contrary to before that it would be inappropriate to mention and throw in the mood he now tried to sustain. When I sat down, he pushed my wine closer to me. As the song continued, all I can do is pray the Lord above will let me walk in the sun once more. Ha! I flew in the sun once, never mind walk in it, and I feel as though I'll, I'll fly in it once again, my grandfather said as he swayed back and forth with his glass of wine to his face. He helped myself, I helped myself to a few si sit. I helped myself to a few sips of the red blend and observed my grandfather sit down. He took a heavy gulp and then raised something from a small wooden box on the side of the table. And then noticed that it was a large pistol, specifically his World War II M1911.45 caliber pistol. Next to the box, I noticed dirty and moist rags next to the paper towels. He just finished cleaning it. He then inserted an animation. He then asserted an animation magazine into the base of the pistol and tapped it into place then pulled it back to, this, to the slide before releasing it sending the slide back into position effectively leading around into the chamber it's loaded he said half matter of fact and half warningly why did you take it out i asked don't be a naive boy robberies and burglaries and riots they always come during these storms this is a time for self-defense, just in case. I didn't mind the firearm, but what I did mind instead was my grandfather's mental health and drinking around the firearm. 
You know how to shoot? He asked me. I've shot a time or two, I responded. Good. This one's for you. He said as he pulled out a small point thirty eight snub nose revolver. Don't I need a license for that? I asked. Don't leave the house with it and you're fine, he answered. I wasn't sure if that was legal or not, but I nodded rather than challenge him. After a short moment passed, the record ended. It was silent inside the house now, but outside the winds began to gain, gain velocity. Twilight was nearly over, and so I allowed my curiosity to light. So I may peek through the dark shades and observe the outside world. The waves were crashing larger and louder than usual. The beachfront landscape began to twist and morph. The flags in the front yards of homes blew violently, whipping hard in the air. All the buoy bells and wind chimes rattled and sounded off. Up in the sky, flocks of birds hurried away in formation. Slowly but surely, the winds began to howl. I closed the blinds and took a step back. Do not worry, my boy. It's just a storm. It will pass as all storms do, but be ready for anything. Now come get dinner. I'm not sure if I have the right words to explain, but what came next, what my grandfather and I faced, but it... It is important that I do my best to recall the events as, with as much accuracy as I can for all the sakes of the police, my family, and for myself. The rain came down upon our house like machine gun fire, loudly, ferociously, fast, and seemingly endless. The thunder cracked like bombs above us, and we could detect the flashes of lightning when the light, when they lit up the dark. glow for a moment visible even through the dark even through the drawn dark shades now and then that unsettling unrelenting fuck now and then that unrelenting lighthouse would flash its lamplight our way and distant fog horns of ships sounded off and closed by the noise of garbage cans flying across the pavement and yards filled our ears. The thunderclouds set off car alarms, neighborhood dogs barked, and the winds wailed and tracked everything in their path. My grandfather and I had suddenly lost power, but we were not phase as we knew it was inevitable. We struck candles and placed them throughout my the home. It was then we heard a loud bang against the side door which led directly to the garbage cans. Behind the garbage can was another gate which when opened gave you direct access to the beach. At first I thought nothing of it of course but then the banging was non-stop as if someone was there. I peeked outside a window closer to the door but I could not see anything. Again, I heard the noise this time much heavier, heavy enough to catch my grandfather's attention and his suspicion. I went to open the door, but my grandpa ran over and threw himself in front of it. There's no one there. It's just the wind, he said in excitement. Suddenly, another loud bang struck the front door and then both doors at once. We looked at each other without saying a word. I could feel feverish fear radiating from, from his face and knew that only paranoia and panic could follow. Without another hesitation, he withdrew his 1911 from his waist and, and held it firmly in his right hand. He stared at me blankly for a moment before he leaned into a whisper in my ear. They're here. He then hopped over to the table and grabbed the snug nose. Point thirty eight and carefully handed it to me. His fingers grasped the pistol, my heart began to race, and my breathing began my breathing became hev heavy and difficult. What is happening? I asked. There's no time to explain. We should call the police, I asked. He dismissed the saying. It's too late. They're here now. They're finally here. 
He ran across the room and threw himself against the wall beside the front door. A third banging now began on where the garage door was located. I looked over to my grandfather, who calmly spoke. Aim towards the door, Sonny. I could not comprehend what or why quick enough, but before I could blink, my grandfather threw the door open and then turned to face what was on the doorstep. But nothing was there. Cowards! He shouted, his face muffled by wind which ripped the screen door from its hinges and hurled it into the street. My grandfather leaned into the regular door and managed to close it. It's the storm! I shouted. No, that's what they want you to think! He boomed inside the home, as though still competing with the volume of the wind. He approached the side door this time, grabbing a flashlight. He slowly opened the door this time, as if it were a surprise for whoever was at the door. In another swift moment, my grandfather had a light and pistol face towards the threshold, but this was, this too was empty. Now I can, couldn't see what my grandfather saw then, but he shined his light around the, in the darkness of the hurricane, shining it down upon the sand every few moments. The area was visible out of a failing lighthouse. He turned to me, his face already red with windburn. The footprints, the footprints, he said. You fuckers, he shouted as he then ran outside, leaping into darkness. I was frozen, unsure as to what was occurring. The storm and rain continued, but the banging on our property ceased the moment my grandfather exited. I stood there scared and perplexed and wondered. Were there actually people that caused the banging? They moved like spirits, spirits that somehow knew that my grandfather had left the premises. What did they want? Was it simply the wind? Had my grandpa finally snapped and lost his mind? All these questions wrestled inside my puzzled mind as I tightly gripped snug nose in my hand still. I then heard what I thought sounded like a gunshot. I went to call the police, but in excitement, I had forgotten where I placed my phone. That was when I heard a second gunshot. I took a deep breath and then ran outside, clumsily collapsing into the fence and take, taking cover there. From there, I would run, then dive onto the sand while the lighthouse light passed so as not to be found by whatever my grandfather chased after. I looked behind me for footsteps to see where my grandfather and his enemies were. The hurricane winds erased even my own. There was not even a single trace of my grandfather or anything. I ran on, blind in the dark, timing the lighthouse light and my dives every second, seven seconds. The winds of the hurricane blowing the sharp sand against me, passing my ears with the volume of passing trains. Just an endless blast of wind noise. I squinted, but it was Good as having my eyes shut, and so I shut my eyes and ran like a maniac in the abyss. I couldn't hear my my panting, but I knew my heart was pounding. I held a gun firmly and covered to run out. Each time I went to call out my grandfather's name, I received sand in my mouth. With not a clue if I ran straight or in a mindless circle, I determined that the best course... <sighs> I determined that the best course of action was to return back to the shelter of the house. A second aside on this, I turned around. Boom! Something heavy, maybe driftwood, struck my head and sent me crashing down flat on my back. I rolled over in pain, hot, moist blood still dripping from my head. and staining my hair. I couldn't see it, but I felt dripping all over. Soon I was dizzy and fell to the ground and began to crawl. Then suddenly the beach all around me was lit up. The lighthouse lamp might have come jammed or broken, for it was now stuck in the direction I looked. Next, I noticed my grandfather, some 30 feet from me, staring at the sky, unfazed by the elements, fixated on whatever was above him, and slowly raising his pistol towards the sky. Through my squinting eyes, I saw above us what appeared to be a large helicopter suspended 
and hovering in the sky with his lights as well fixed on my grandfather, as if he were an actor on a stage under a large spotlight. I then noticed that the light upon us in the surrounding maybe 15 to 50 to 100 feet around us was not from the lighthouse, but from this aircraft over the ocean. I put my hands around my eyes. Then, as my hands for binoculars shooting my eyes, I looked around, me trying to call out to my grandfather. Grandpa, what's going on? I could now see the blood from my head dripping off my wet, sandy hands. I'm hurt. Let's go home. Let's get out of here. I strained my vocals. I could not compete with the overpowering volume of the wind, and my grandpa still remained still like a statue. So I ran towards him, getting hit with, with my debris from breathe from the wind until I crashed into him which snapped him out of a stupor. <sighs> he yelled, just barely audible over the storm. He readjusted his arm and, and aim and began to frantically fire bullets at the helicopter above us. He threw himself to the ground beneath him so as to not get hit. I could feel the hot shells that ejected from the pistol shrink down on me. I raced for my own waistband and realized my pistol was gone, buried. No doubt in the sand somewhere. My grandfather continued to reload and fire uninterrupted without hesitation. There was a terror and horror in his face. I peered up at the aircraft and the second light seemed to come from where the ocean reaches the beach. I could not tell if my eyes played tricks on me, but it looked as if a large vessel was, was becoming beached and passed on by as if it were a ghost ship. Was this the case of his terror? Was this the thing part of the aircraft above? Or was it a navy or the coast guard? I could not tell. I was overwhelmed by exhaustion, pain, confusion, and the storm. And my father's terror. My grandfather pulled out his last magazine and turned to me. He then grabbed me by my shirt and pulled me close enough where our faces almost touched. He then yelled in my ears with all of his might. Michael, run! Michael, run! I went to move, but I was frozen as my feet were burned in the sand. My grandfather then turned to me and pointed the pistol at me. Holy shit, stop, you're crazy! I I said automatically. <coughs> the fear un unlocked my feet and I began to run aimlessly in the opposite direction. I don't know what compelled me to do it. Maybe it was instinct, but I ran to the nearest dune I could find, and from there I watched my grandfather shoot his final bullets standing there with defiance against his unknown enemy. Why didn't they, why, why didn't they, or this thing shoot back or run away? It was madness. Everything was bewilderment and madness. My vision was beginning to blur, and by now I was consciously fighting off oncoming unconsciousness. Through the onslaught of the sands and the crawling pain from the wood's impact with my head. Just then, after shielding my eyes as though my body hands were, were binocular, I watched my grandfather in something in the nearing distance. Like a massive wall was coming closer and closer. I noticed it then to be a, a massive wave, like a tidal wave. I stood up in shock and screamed for my grandpa as loud as I could. Without a moment, without a further warning or time to react, suddenly he was gone. Gone. Just completely gone. But then the wave hit the beach and the lights from above vanished. All at once, without reason or explanation, I stood up on the high dune watching the black water cover the less dark, by contrast, sand. My house now resumed as normal as if it were never interrupted. I went to go shout for my grandfather again, but something thunderous above me boomed. The storm increased and completely depleted. I surrendered to my exhaustion and collapsed. My world was now completely engulfed in silence and darkness. When I woke up yesterday, I was in the hospital. I woke up with stitches and bruising and was soon released. Upon returning to my grandfather, I wrote everything I could remember the second I got home. Backtracking, though, when I did wake up, my aunt and uncle shared a room with me. And upon seeing my, 
me over my eyes. They alerted the nurses and a police officer who came in from just outside the door. They greeted me and asked if I was okay. Before I could answer, they said I had suffered a minor, minor concussion and a few stitches on the head and had only been asleep for several hours. They also let me know that the police patrol on the shore found me with their searchlights. When I asked about my grandfather, they said they regretted to be the ones to tell me, but that he is, was missing and with no clues as to how or where. They were hoping I could assist them. It all came back to me in a flash. All the confusion, excitement, and fear rushed back to me. I could not hide my excitement excitement and they saw it the police officer stepped forward and suggested i come by the station when i felt better to give any witness statement or testimony as to what occurred and what i knew i have made copies of everything i have written with the hopes that someone will understand or can explain everything it's been a few months now and my grandfather is still missing and presumed dead due to drowning i want to believe that i really do but the memories are still fresh and are still perplexing to me. I cannot help but reflect on the conversation I had with him in church about ghost extraterrestrials. Did the ghost ship come for him? Something from another world? I cannot help wondering if he was just insane from war or whatever mysterious circumstances followed him or just coincidences. Coincidences. Did the advanced intelligence take him? It drove me nearly crazy and has kept me up for what seems like endless nights now, to the point I needed to have sleeping pills described to me. So many questions I know. Was this all just madness? Was it an instance or an experience that happened in a single moment and drove him mad? Was it triggered by the storm? Was there something he witnessed in the sky or in the ocean that day his friends disappeared? Did he see it again the night of the hurricane? Did he know too much? Was he better off dead some, some than to linger alive? Or is it simply that his mental alignments had too much of an influence on me while I nearly isolated with him for just under two weeks? It was, it was a contagious paranoia, paranoia. I had to answer. I have to have answers. And I want to believe that he just had a mental episode triggering by the Coast Guard or the storm. And that the a wave did in fact claim his life. A fitting death for a naval man fighting until the last breath and being consumed and buried. Really as if returned to the ocean where all the madness, power, and haunting memories belonged. Please God, I pray. I pray, please let him be dead and reunited with Grandma or his beloved ocean, and unharmed by forces I can never explain. Polybius In Portland, Oregon in 1981, an unheard of new arcade game appeared in several suburbs, something of a rarity at that time. This game was called Polybius. The game proved to be incredibly popular to the point of addiction, and the queues formed around the machines quickly followed by clusters of visits from men in black. Rather than the usual marketing data collected by company visitors to arcade machines, they collected some unknown data, allegedly testing responses to the, to the psychoactive machines. The players themselves suffered from a series of unpleasant side effects. Amnesia, insomnia, nightmares, night terrors, and suicide, appearing as having been caused by the game in various versions of legend. Some players stopped playing the video games, while it is reported that one became an anti-gaming activist. Even though that's the end of that story, a Polybius story, there's an alternate story, so I'm going to read that too. Polybius, alternate story. Polybius is an urban legend about a rare arcade game released in 1981. The game was created by a mysterious company called uh, Sinus Lotion. 
It was a puzzle shoot 'em up somewhat like Tempest. It was only released in a few suburbs of Portland, Oregon. It was supposedly very popular with people forming long lines to play it. However, players reported strange things about the game, such as hearing a woman crying and seeing her grotesque faces out of the corner of their eyes. Players would also have nightmares, experience nausea, headaches, blackouts, or even develop amnesia. Some even committed suicide. Others stopped playing video games altogether, and at least one became an anti-video game activist. According to one owner of an arcade, men wearing black suits would often come to collect records from the game. They did not take any money, simply data on gameplay. Because of this, plain theory is that some sort of government experiment using subliminal messages. The game remains in obscurity as around one month after its release, all the cabinets suddenly disappeared. One cabinet reappeared in arcade 1998, but the but quickly disappeared again. While some have tried to recreate the game, no one has ever found the original ROM. Robert the Doll In the late 1800s, Thomas Otto and his family moved into a mansion at the corner of Eaton and Simonton Streets in Key West, Florida, now known as the Artist's House. Autos were known to be stern with their servants, sometimes even mistreating them. It was the treatment of one such heightened servant that provides a twist in the story. <laughs> this woman was hired to take care of their son, Robert. One day, Miss Otto supposedly witnessed her practicing black magic in their backyard and fired her. Before she left, the woman gave Robert a lifelike doll which stood three feet tall, had buttons for eyes, human hair, and was filled with straw. Dolls that resembled children were not unheard of during this time, but this one proved to be special. Robert named the doll after himself and often dressed it in his, in his clothes. Robert the doll became his trustworthy companion. He took it with him on shopping trips into town. The doll had a seat at the dinner table where Robert would sneak in bites of food when the parents were looking. Robert would even be tucked into bed with the boy at night. Soon his innocent relationship took on a strange nature. Soon after, Robert chose to be referred to by his middle name, Jean. After being scolded by his mother, he told her that Robert was the doll's name, not his. Jean was often heard in his toy's room, often having conversations with Robert. Jean would say something in a childish manner, and responses could be heard in a much lower voice. Sometimes Jean would become very agitated, worrying the servants and his mother. She would, on occasion, burst in to find his son cowering in a corner while Robert sat perched in a chair or on the bed glaring at him. This was only the beginning. Household objects would be found thrown across the room. Jean's toys turned up mutilated and giggling could be heard. Whenever these unusual acts took place, Jean always said, Robert did it. The boy took the punishment but always insisted that the blame was was Robert's. As the mischief grew, more and more servants took their leave as new ones were hired. The Otto's relatives felt it was time to do something. With the recommendation of a great aunt, Jean's parents removed Robert from his care and placed him in a box in the attic, which this is where he resided for many years. After his death of his father, Jean was will willed his boyhood home. He decided to live in a Victorian mansion with his new wife. Jean had become an artist and felt the house was spacious and would provide a place for him to paint. He went to the attic and dusted off his childhood toy. He became attached to the doll despite his wife's displeasure. Jean would take the doll along with them everywhere they went. He even sat in his favorite 
little chair when Jean, his wife, slept, slept nearby. The turret room became Robert's domain after Miss Otto moved him back to the attic. Their marriage slowly became sour until Miss Otto supposedly went insane and died of unknown reasons. Jean followed soon behind. Robert supposedly attacked people, sometimes locking them in the attic. People who passed by claimed to hear evil laughter coming from the turret room. For some time, Robert remained in an empty house by himself until a new family purchased the mansion and restored it. The doll was once again moved to the attic. This displeased it as much as the last time. The doll was often found throughout the house. On one certain night, Robert was found at the foot of the owner's bed, giggling with a kitchen knife in hand. This is enough to send them fleeing from the home. Robert was later moved to the East Martillo Museum in Key West, where he sits perched in a glass box. Despite his new living quarters, the doll is believed to not have given up his menacing ways. Visitors and employees claim they have seen the doll move. His smile has been known to turn into a scowl. One employee cleaned Robert, turned off all the lights, and left for the night. The next day, he returned to find the lights turned on. Robert sitting in a different position than the night before, and a fresh layer of dust on his shoes. Some say he'll even curse you if you want to take a picture of him. You must ask politely. He'll tilt his head in permission. However, if he doesn't, and you take the picture anyway, a curse will befall upon you and anyone who accompanied Hugh to the museum. The same will happen if you make fun of him. To this day, Robert remains at the East Martillo Museum in a sailor suit, clutching his stuffed lion, continuing his menacing ways.